Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This uh, I'd like to call to order this March 1st meeting of the Bloomington City Council. I'd like you to uh, join us as we start our meeting, as we always do, with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you please stand and join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening, Council, and uh, members of the public who are watching, and all our staff and speakers who are going to be with us this evening. Ms. Christensen, if we could start the evening with our roll call of Council members, please. Thank you. Council Member Beloga? Here. Council Member Carter? Here. Council Member Coulter? Present. Council Member Lohman? Councilmember Lohman? Here. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Martin? Here. Councilmember Nelson? Here. Mayor Bussey? Here. All seven members of the Bloomington City Council are present this evening. Take us to item three on our agenda, the approval of the agenda. Council, any additions, subtractions, or revisions to this evening's agenda? Hearing none, I would move approval of this evening's agenda. Uh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Beloga. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, we have a couple items that I think are uh, going to, uh, would be good if we could have a public input period on them. I know that uh, they're not listed as hearings, so there isn't a schedule. But uh, the conversion therapy ban, uh, we had that, but I think a lot of people are really just getting uh, an understanding that that's an agenda for uh, the console tonight. And I've gotten, and I suspect we all have, uh, a tremendous outpouring from the community. And while that's an you know, opportunity, I think it's also good to have some uh, uh, opportunity to hear these people directly uh, express their comments either for or against conversion therapy. So uh, that is my comment for the night on that. Thank you. So council member, I, I, I agree. I've received also quite a bit of feedback on that as well, but I wonder, do we want to wait until we actually have an ordinance to talk about right now? We're just kind of reviewing the draft. Uh, do we want to wait? We will obviously have a public hearing once we have the, uh, the, the ordinance in front of us. And uh, I think, I'm thinking that might be the more appropriate time to have, to take public comment after we've worked through the draft language and, and ironed out the bugs that we will be talking about this evening. Thoughts? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think that's uh, good input. Uh, uh, so the people uh, have heard that and will know to dial in at a later time, thank you. Absolutely. This will. Uh, th this is uh, the discussion tonight, and we're talking about um, 8.2, which is our con conversion therapy draft ordinance review. Uh, the key word there is draft. We will be talking about it in draft form. It's not the final version to come before us, and I do think it's most appropriate to, uh, when we have the public hearing, to have it on the final ordinance that we're actually going to be considering. I think that just makes seems to make the most sense, and um, definitely want public input on this. And I'm sure we'll have a, uh, a spirited conversation on it. But I think to do it with a, with the formal proposal in front of us as opposed to the draft language that we'll be talking about tonight is more appropriate. Council, any other suggestions? I saw a couple of hands go up and then go down again. Is that, uh, was there anybody who wanted to chime in on anything? Council Member Mayor, uh, Nelson? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I, Council I, Member Coulter, go ahead. I, I saw your hand go up earlier. I, I was just gonna make the exact point that you were gonna make, that I, I think it's better for us to notice the public hearing when we have an actual when we have actual ordinance to, and language to look at absolutely councilmember nelson yeah thank you mayor my question was on item 6.4 and whether or not i know there's some people with questions with regards to the pavement management program and some curbs and things like that and i didn't know if we were gonna have an opportunity i, I believe staff is prepared to provide information to people that had questions so um, but i didn't know if we we're gonna take any input on that or not 
Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, his staff's recommendation because the notice to the neighbors indicated that uh, there would be an opportunity. So we'll pull it from consent. And if the mayor would be so good as to allow some comment, that would be great. We will absolutely do that. We will uh, plan on pulling that from the consent agenda, item 6.4, and we'll uh, uh, discuss that. We'll have a staff, staff discussion and we'll hear from uh, the neighbors uh, and the residents who have comments on that as well. All right. Well, the mayor, I'll provide that second uh, to your uh, uh, to your uh, motion. Thank you, Councilmember Lohman. We've got a motion by myself and a second by Councilmember Lohman to accept our agenda for this evening. Further discussion, Council? Hearing none. Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0, and we have an agenda for this evening. We move on to item four on our agenda, which is our public comment period, and item 4.1, which is a response to prior meetings public comments. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council members. We only had one uh, resident address the council at our previous meeting, uh, Mr. David Clark, and uh, I think that most of his uh, comments were directed at the council, uh, but he did uh, express an opinion that uh, the council would maybe, um, or he asked the council to consider rescinding the rezoning related to the 86th and Penn uh, project, development project that was approved a couple of months ago. Um, the only, uh, the, the, there is no process uh, to rescind rezoning. Uh, although the city council does have the ability to initiate rezoning, uh, that's clarified in city code section 19.13. Uh, it would take a majority vote and that can happen once 12 months has passed from the date of the last rezoning application. That would trigger notification and public hearings before the Planning Commission and the City Council. Uh, and it's uh, important to note that even if the site were rezoned, the development plan has been approved and it is valid for two years. So the path that Mr. Clark requested uh, is not one that is currently available. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. Council, any questions on that? Mr. Verbrugge's response to Mr. Clark's comments last week? If not, I will now, I'd like to open the public comment period. And uh, public comment period is a, a time at each of our council meetings where we set aside 20 minutes for uh, residents to call in and comment on anything not on tonight's agenda for up to five minutes. We do enforce the five minute limit to make sure that we're fair for everyone calling in. And uh, I always want to make clear to folks that it's, a, it's not a back and forth with the council and it's not because we're ignoring you. It's just a matter of being able to uh, respond accordingly and properly as Mr. Brugge just did uh, in response to Mr. Clark's comments last week rather than trying to do that off the cuff to actually prepare a formal and official response. So I would like to open the public comment period now and I will ask Ms. Wilson, do we have anyone on the line who wishes to speak to the public comment period? Alicia, this is Chris, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Do we have any callers that wish to speak to the council on agenda item 4.2, the public comment period? For anyone who would like to ask a question during the session, you may press star one. You have Elizabeth Longo, her line is open. Hi there, um, my name is Elizabeth Longo. I'm a resident in Hillcrest, Southbrook area under uh, Jack Beloga's District 3. Good evening and, and welcome. I Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Um, I am not debating whether a person has a biological inclination towards a non-heterosexual sexuality nor debating the issue of gender dysphoria. City Council, please uphold the right to privacy, the sole right of an individual. Ms. Longo, excuse me. Choose a licensed Ms. Longo. Health practitioner. Ms. Longo, Hello? excuse me. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, we, we set aside public comment period to, to comment on things not on tonight's agenda. And uh, you're obviously okay. speaking to item 8.4, which is the, the conversion therapy ban proposal. And the draft language we'll be talking okay. about later. Um, as I mentioned earlier, once we have a formal uh, ordinance drafted and it, will, it comes before the city council, there will be a time for public comment. Okay. We will hold a public hearing on sure. this. We absolutely will. Okay, thank you. I apologize. No, nope, not a problem at all. Not a problem at all, but please. I, I would like 
to say, um, then I, what I, I will keep it. I will not speak on that. What I would like to talk about is a general way of I feel that our uh, beloved city council, I realize you are all freely elected and you work so hard for our city, and I appreciate that as a longtime member of the city. But I do feel that with the current COVID pandemic, I'm not even sure if we're still under an emergency order or not, but at the start of the pandemic, when you did declare an emergency order, there would be just emergency business, the business that would just keep the city running. And there has been a lot of stuff that's being pushed through when we are not allowed to come sit in the council chambers due to COVID, I believe, and I've mentioned this before, I believe you all could pass a resolution or an ordinance or whatever you have to do to open up the theater, that beautiful theater that is not being used and allow us, we the people, to come actually in person to the council meetings. I believe it would be a, go a long way to the left, to the right, to the middle, everyone, one, one Bloomington, together Bloomington, to have we the people sitting in front of you. And um, I just think that it would be a good thing because we know you work so hard and it would be a lot nicer. I think there'd be a lot more engagement of the people uh, with the with the city, and um, so with that said, I guess I thank you for your time. And thank you for your comments, Ms. Longo. And, and I will say we are still under an emergency declaration. We're following the governor's emergency declaration. As long as the the state has under that emergency declaration, we are uh, under our own. And uh, the 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 setup that we have, the social distancing that we have in place uh, regarding around our council meetings. Uh, I agree 100%. I, I cannot wait until we have people back in the council chambers or, for that matter, in the, um, uh, in the theater. But uh, we're, we're, as, we said, as I said, we're still under that, um, under that emergency order. So, Ms. Wilson, do we have anyone else to speak to the council under public comment period? Item 4.2. Lisa, do we have other callers for the public comment period? For anyone who would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. We have no further questions. Thank you. Seeing no one else coming forward, I will close this evening's public comment period and thank Ms. Longo for her comments. Thanks for others, to others who have spoken in the past. And uh, again, I. Looking forward to getting back together with folks, but this is the, what we're, we've got in front of us right now. So uh, certainly encourage folks to speak at the public comment period. Uh, certainly encourage folks to send those emails, the phone calls that I've been getting. Uh, that, that's the way that we're able to do it right now, and I encourage you to take advantage of that because that's the reality that we're working under right now, uh, for better or for worse, under this, uh, this COVID emergency declaration. And speaking of our COVID emergency declaration, I'd like to move to item five, which is uh, item 5.1, which is our COVID-19 organizational and public health update. And Dr. Nick Kelly is here with us this evening once again, as he is on the first meeting of every month to provide us an update on our COVID-19 status in the city of Bloomington. Good evening, Dr. Kelly. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. In March of last year, we provided an online state of the community update related to COVID-19. We knew the coming year was going to be hard. We didn't fully appreciate how hard it was going to be. In the last year, at least 7,300 of our neighbors have become sick with COVID-19. Just under 500 were hospitalized and 142 died. Our economy, schools, social events, entertainment, and daily lives have been substantially altered. One year later, we're all wearing masks, keeping social distance and limiting time in confined, crowded spaces with poor air circulation. I originally thought it'd be at least 18 months before we had a vaccine, and I was thrilled to be wrong about that. This weekend, the third vaccine was authorized for use, and the light at the end of the tunnel keeps getting brighter. Having three vaccines within 13 months is a phenomenal accomplishment. All three vaccines provide 100% protection from hospitalization and death in clinical trials. That is the most important outcome you could ask for in a vaccine. So I would urge you to get whatever vaccine you are offered. They work incredibly well, are exceptionally safe, and we are seeing the impact already. Outbreaks in nursing homes have fallen substantially. 
On Friday, February 26, Bloomington Public Health completed its 28th COVID-19 vaccination clinic. The division has provided 4,304 vaccines to date, primarily to our healthcare personnel serving our community. This week, we're shifting our vaccination efforts to focus on school and child care staff, and soon after, adults 65 and older. Resources and vaccine allocation continue to grow. We're now able to do around 1,000 doses a week. So far, public health has been able to use 100% of our allocated vaccine within 72 hours. This is a testament to the incredible work of city staff and volunteers making sure our supplies are ready, our clinics are staffed, and our appointments are always fully booked. As we shift to adults 65 and older, our strategy is going to shift too. As vaccine supply increases and access grows, we are going to be focusing on making sure there's an equitable distribution. We will be more targeted in how we vaccinate adults 65 and older, working to address structural barriers to vaccination. Vaccines are the exit strategy from this pandemic. And as we prepare for that exit, we must make sure as few of our neighbors as possible get COVID in the coming months. Since it'll take time for us to roll out the vaccine to everyone who wants it, we have to stay vigilant and focused, limiting our time in crowded places, confined and enclosed spaces. With wearing a mask that covers your nose and mouth, containing two or more layers of washable, breathable fabric that fits snugly over your face without gaps. Don't take chances with your neighbors, coworkers, friends, or classmates. Stay home if you feel unwell and get tested for COVID. If you're returning to the classroom as a student or staff, please use the testing resources available to you for free. Get tested regularly. Spring is around the corner and I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that it'll be a different spring. I'm increasingly confident that every adult who wants to be vaccinated against COVID-19 will be able to do so by late spring or early summer here in Minnesota. That being said, I am concerned about the variants and how they could alter the spring we are anticipating. We are already starting to see cases level off. This is concerning because we see the variants of concern growing exponentially. March may be a challenging month because of the B117 variant is projected to become the dominant strain in the United States. We're in a race against these variants, and I'm concerned about another peak in cases with the variants. Our ability to use all of our mitigation strategies to prevent infections, including vaccination, is critical. I urge everyone to get vaccinated as soon as, as, soon as you are eligible. Wherever you can, be at your doctor's office, local pharmacy, state-run vaccine site, or one of our clinics. If you've not done so already, sign up at mn.gov vaccine connector or call 833-431-2053. This tool will help connect you to the vaccine appointment when you are eligible for vaccination. I'm optimistic that our tried and true strategies for preventing COVID-19 and increasing vaccination rates will help us turn the corner. We control our own destiny in this pandemic, keeping vigilant and being kind to one another. Much like the increasing daylight we're getting daily, the light at the end of the tunnel grows brighter. While this journey is not easy, we're gonna get through this together. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Council, any questions of Dr. Kelly this evening? I just want to say thank you to Dr. Kelly and to uh, all the staff in public health. The, uh, the, the clinic underway here at uh, Civic Plaza uh, stopped down to, to observe on a few occasions, and it's running like clockwork, and you folks are doing great work under, um, under stressful situations, uh, circumstances. I understand that, and you're doing a very good job, and I appreciate it. And uh, appreciate all the, the long hours and the hard work and the dedication that uh, you and, and, and your staff and, and the folks working there, uh, it is greatly appreciated. You're right. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and, and uh, we can see it now. And I, I'm looking forward to getting there. Thank you, Mayor. Council, anything else? All right. If not, uh, I just I received an email from a resident who said that she was on hold and trying to get into public comment, and apparently there was a technical glitch. So uh, if the council will indulge me, I'd like to double back to public comment for just, uh, just a speaker here who, uh, as I said, had called in saying that she was trying to get on. So 
Uh, Ms. Wilson, can, can you help us out? Can you find Ms. Mus Ms. Morose on, uh, on our system looking to speak to us? Alicia, can you hear me? This is Chris. Yes, I can hear you. Do we have a caller, Natalie Morose, on the line? And if so, could you patch you her through, please? Sure. Hello, any snow open? Ms. Morose, are you there? Good evening. Good evening. Sorry Hi. about the technical glitch. I apologize for that. Glad we could uh, double back to you. Thanks for, for emailing and calling it to, to our attention. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for responding to that. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Natalie Morose. I'm a longtime resident of Bloomington, and thanks to you, look forward to living here for a long time. I have met so many terrific people that care about this city and its future. Many of the friendships I've made are all thanks to you, and for that, I'm truly grateful. My calling this evening was prompted by tonight's meeting agenda packet. Seeing what the staff prepared for you is concerning to me. We saw this happen with ranked choice voting and other issues in the past. Until now, I have not spoken to you about it specifically. Obviously, there are too many things for you to be fully informed on as council members of a city our size. My understanding is that the responsibility of those you appoint to various city commissions is to do the legwork in gathering and synthesizing information. I appreciate the passion and countless hours that fellow Bloomington residents volunteer to serve on the commissions. And I know they gather information from numerous sources. What concerns me after looking through the agenda packet is that only one side of issues are presented to you. I'd like to know why on what seems to be a controversial subject on tonight's agenda that staff who are not volunteers, but rather full-time employees paid by our taxes did not see to it that you had information from both sides. I'd like to know why if they were not included with the commission's information, paid staff did not see to it that all views were made known. To make matters worse, what is included in the packet are emails from people like Michael Howard, who is Minnesota House Representative, Steve Elkins, House of Representatives, Andrew Carlson, Minnesota House of Representatives, Debbie Godel, Hennepin County Commissioner, also from Together Bloomington, and BARC. And those from the state or county offices could speak from personal experience or were experts on a particular issue, I'd understand their emails being included. Otherwise, please tell us why they have influence on your vote in our city matters. I and other residents email and even call you. What we discover is that your mind is already made up before hearing all points of view from residents. On this particular topic, I thought like many of you did until I did my own research. If you as a council are the ones making the decisions, then you should be the ones I'm sorry, I'm reading and lost it here. Just a second, please. I'm not sure where the breakdown is, but residents' views, even those, or perhaps especially those who differ from a commission, should be included in the information that you use to make your decisions. If the volunteer residents serving on the commissions are doing their job, the full-time and part-time paid staff should be doing theirs too. If you as the council are the ones making the decisions, then you should be given the information needed to make an informed decision. Your decision can only be as good as the intel you receive. If the commission members are making city decisions or if staff are making the decisions, then those are the people we should be electing. We don't elect them, we elect you, the mayor and council members. We should have the confidence that you listen to the voices of all Bloomington residents and make decisions on behalf of those in Bloomington who elected you, not those who financed your campaign. Equity and inclusion is only equity and inclusion if it is equitable for all and it includes all. I'd like to know where the breakdown is and how all residents can have their voices heard, even when their point of view differs from those you've appointed or have the city manager or who the city manager hires. At the next meeting, please let me know what the best way for us to be heard by the council is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morose. Ms. Wilson, can we make one last check to see if there's anybody else uh, who wishes to speak to uh, public comment and don't, don't want to leave anybody behind? Alisa, do you have any other callers that wish to speak on public comment, agenda item 4.2? We don't have questions at this time. We don't have any other callers? 
Yes, we don't have any other colors. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks for double checking. And again, apologize for the oversight there, and I'm glad we were able to double back and get Ms. Morose's comments. Uh, Councilmember Coulter, a question? Um, <clears throat> sorry, Mayor, I just wanted to make a brief clarification here. Um, there was mentioned that in the, the packet tonight, and at least the way I interpreted this comment, it, it sounded to me as though there was mention that there was there were no there was no written correspondence from anyone opposed to the proposed ordinance prohibiting conversion therapy. And I lost count because you called on me before I got to the end of the list, but I count at least 10 or 15 residents who either jointly with somebody else or by themselves submitted a uh, written comment to that effect. So I, I just want to clarify that in the council packet, there were there was indeed resident communication opposed to that proposed ordinance. Thank you for that clarification, Councilmember Coulter. Councilmember Lohman. So I wanted to just do some additional clarification. I think there was a little bit of uh, miscommunication there, and I do want to clarify. Uh, I did have a conversation earlier with Natalie uh, Murnos about this and what she was talking about, just so uh, both the council and the general public is clear, uh, what she was discussing was about uh, what staff had provided, not um, uh, residents. Um, that was her comments and probably just didn't come across clearly there, but uh, just wanna be sure that both the council and, and the general public is, is aware of what she was talking about. Thank you. Also, anything else? If not, let's move on with our agenda. Let's move on to item six, which is our consent agenda. Council member Martin, you have our consent business this evening. I do indeed. Uh, so far, I believe there are holds, uh, I think a hold from me on item 6.1 and a hold from Council Member Nelson on item 6.4. Uh, was there anybody else uh, that wanted to hold anything? Okay. Uh, Mayor, I'm happy to uh, move the rest of that if uh, there's nobody else. Please. Uh, Mayor, I motion approval of items 6.2. 6.3, 6.5, and 6.6. Second, Coulter. We have a motion by Councilmember Martin and a second by Councilmember Coulter to accept the consent business as stated. Hearing no further council discussion, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Beluga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. So let's hold item uh, 6.1 for the uh, the end as we typically do and move to item 6.4. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And as I mentioned earlier, I just, I didn't know if anybody would be calling in to have any comments on this as well, but I do know we received some correspondence from residents that had concerns about the um, type of curb that they have within the neighborhood and maybe some confusion about the scope of the project. And they uh, just want to make sure if they're curb was being replaced, that it was replaced with a uh, lower profile. And um, I, I guess if at this point, if there's anyone from staff that might be able to just sort of explain this for anybody watching that was concerned about this issue, what, what that process is. I believe we have a, a number of staff members here. I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Santana, who I know is uh, heading this up. Good after, good evening, Mr. Santana. Welcome. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Bussey. Good evening, council members. So with the correspondence that was coming in, this is related to the issues of mountable curb and the the height that it cre creates as somebody enters a driveway. This is an issue that we see in many of the neighborhoods in Bloomington when we go through with our, our maintenance or reconstruction project. In this case, uh, we received correspondence from a neighborhood on our maintenance project that we will be completing later this summer. In the correspondence, residents asked why we are leaving the mountable curb at its existing height, why we don't work to, to decrease that height to make it easier for vehicles to transition into the driveway. The reasoning behind that is that there is often increased work that exists beyond just the opening of the driveway. Decreasing the height of the driveway by even a few inches will lead to uh, substantial work behind the curb 
that will include uh, reconstructing the concrete or asphalt driveways, as well as regrading the boulevard areas adjacent to them. With the information that we provided to council, we had asked them to consider three different options pertaining to how they would like us to, to proceed. Um, in the past, we have worked with residents to coordinate their work from private contractors along during our projects. We've also worked with them to complete a position and waiver process. That can be done where the work is taken on by the city, but then the, the work and design fees and administration are assessed to the residents at 100% of the cost. And similarly, in some cases, the, the work is done adjacent to or with the project if it is in fact impeding the, the flow of water along a roadway. Well, I, I appreciate that explanation. I also just want to thank staff. I know that you worked with people prior to this meeting that had questions to help make sure that uh, they understood what this process is. And I think originally there were people that were concerned that all of the uh, curbs at driveways were being replaced. Um, they aren't. The, the existing curbs are, um, uh, for the most part, functionally um, still great. I mean, they don't need to be replaced at this point. So instead of incurring that expense, my understanding is they won't be as part of this project um, unless the uh, residents want to do that um, uh, on their own. So is that going to clarify it? I think. Council, any uh, additional questions of Mr. Santana? I think we uh, all saw the uh, extensive staff report on this and a lot of information from uh, feedback from residents and uh, staff information and, and explanation as to uh, the notion or the, uh, the issue of uh, surmountable curbs. Any other questions? If not, I know we did uh, send out note to residents that uh, if anybody wanted to call and uh, speak to this, uh, not as an official public hearing, but more just uh, uh, taking public comment on this item in particular. And uh, so, Ms. Wilson, do we have anybody on the line right now who would like to speak Specifically to item 6.4, which is uh, the uh, resolution or the, the motion to approve plans and specifications for the 2021 pavement management program street maintenance project as it relates to surmountable curbs. Alisa, this is Chris. Do we have any callers for agenda item 6.4? We have one caller. If you would like to ask a question, you may press star one. Thank you. Good evening, are you there? Elisa, do you have a caller patched through? You don't have anyone now on the call. So no callers waiting. Just get disconnected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. We, it looks like we had a caller at one point, uh, no caller waiting. Uh, tell you what, uh, if there was somebody, if there was another technical glitch there, um, if if you could email or text somebody here at the city, and we'll 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 move on with the agenda, but then we'll double back. How about if we just uh, put a hold on this right now and move to item six point one, and then come back to item six point four, just in case we uh, uh, had another technical glitch. I don't want to approve this without uh, if there was folks who would like to uh, to chime in on that, and if there was somebody on the line, I just want to make sure that we don't drop anybody. I think. Is uh, if that's uh, if that's doable, I would like to to do that. And so, why don't we pick up item six point one, and we'll then finish up with item six point four. Sounds good. Um, with regard to item six point one, uh, council's uh, approval to accept donations. I just wanted to put a spotlight and, and thank uh, the providers of our one donation this week, um, the Muslim Community Center, Al Rahman. Uh, as Dr. Kelly noted in his COVID update, uh, while the vaccines are rolling out kind of at an incredible pace, we've still got a lot of folks on the front of lines that need to administer that. Um, this is the 250 N95 and K95 masks uh, that the uh, Muslim Community Center donated are going to go a long, long way uh, as we kind of get out of the woods here with COVID-19. Uh, so just wanted to, to highlight that, say a big thank you. Um, and with that, Mayor, I am happy to move this. Uh, Mayor, I'll move that we... Uh, 
adopt the resolution to accept donations as listed uh, and direct staff to provide uh, appropriate thank yous. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Martin and a second by Council Member Carter to accept item 6.1 on our consent business, uh, donations to the city. Thank you very much to all who donated. Hearing no further council discussion, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Loman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. And now we'll double back and finish up with item 6.4. Uh, again, I was, just want to make sure we haven't dropped anyone inadvertently with uh, the call in. Ms. Wilson, could you check one last time to see if there's anybody calling in for item 6.4? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Alicia, this is Chris. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Chris. Do we have any callers on the line at the moment? We don't have any callers at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, at least uh, we, we had the chance. We doubled back just in case there was somebody there. So glad we could do that. So uh, Council Member Nelson, uh, you held item 6.4. If you'd be willing to move it now uh, after you're hearing the, the, the staff comments and, and not uh, receiving any comments from folks who, um, who were uh, affected by this in some way. Yeah, absolutely, Mayor. And thank you to staff again for just uh, clarifying this issue. And if anybody does have questions, just reach out to the city on it. But with that, I would move approval of item 6.4. Second, Councilmember. We have a motion by Councilmember Nelson and a second by Councilmember Lohman to accept item 6.4 on the consent business. Hearing no further council discussion, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Bowman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Yes, and uh, I echo Councilmember Martin's thanks to staff for the information provided and I know uh, for working with the residents on this because I know there was a lot of questions around this, so I appreciate that. Let's move on to item 7 our agenda our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And item 7.1, which is a public hearing for a new on-sale intoxicating liquor license at Lucky's 13 Pub. Mr. Junker, I'm looking for, there he is. Good evening, Mr. There Junker, is. welcome. Thanks for being with us this evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, yeah, we got a couple new liquor licenses for you tonight. Both are very similar. They're both change in ownerships. And so our first one tonight is uh, Lucky 13, so well-established in our city and uh, just just finished going through a change. So everything's checked out and looking for your approval. Council, any questions of Mr. Junker? The, the only question I have for clarity's sake, this is it's Lucky's 13, not Lucky 13s, correct? And this is, and I just wanted to, okay, it's Lucky's 13. Got it. I mean, I, I believe you, I just, uh, I've heard it about four different ways, I think. No questions from council for Mr. Junker on this. This is a public hearing, and right now I'd like to open the public hearing on item 7.1, a public hearing on the new on-sale intoxicating liquor license application for Lucky's 13 Pub. Ms. Wilson, do we have anyone on the line who wishes to speak to item 7.1? Uh, just a moment, Mr. Mayor. Elisa, do we have any callers for agenda item 7.1? We don't have any color at this time. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Council, we don't have any callers coming forward at this time. With that, I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Carter and a second by Council Member Martin to close the public hearing. There are no further comments from the Council. Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Beluga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Woman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0 to close the public hearing. Council, any additional questions or comments on this? For Mr. Junker, if not, I'd look for action. Mayor, I'm happy to make the motion. Councilmember Carter? I'd move to approve an on-sale intoxicating liquor license for Eclectic Culinary Concepts, Inc., doing business as Lucky's 13 Pub. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Carter, a second by Council Member Martin to approve the new on-sale intoxicating liquor license application at Lucky's 13 Pub. 
Hearing no further discussion, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Loman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Busty? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. We'll be on to item 7.2, another public hearing for another new on sale intoxicating liquor license application. This at the Hyatt Regency Bloomington. Mr. Junker. Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council again. Change ownership at the Hyatt Regency Bloomington uh, just finished up. And uh, again, we've done our due diligence. Everything looks clear. I'm just looking for your approval. Council, questions of Mr. Junker? Hearing none, I'd like to open this public hearing. I'd like to open the public hearing on item 7.20 for the new on sale intoxicating liquor license application for the Hyatt Regency Bloomington. Ms. Wilson, do we have any callers on the line who wish to speak to item 7.2? One moment, Mr. Mayor. Alisa, do we have any callers on the line for agenda item 7.2? We don't have any caller at this time, thank you. No callers at this time? Yes, we don't have any caller at this time. Thank you. <laughs> no, callers. no callers at this time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. No callers coming forward. Council, I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing. Beloga, so moved. Second. Got a motion by Councilmember Beloga and a second by Councilmember Martin to close the public hearing on item 7.2. Hearing no further discussion by the Council, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Loman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0 to close the public hearing. Council, action on this? Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to make a motion on this item. Council Member Beloga. Uh, move to approve an on-sale intoxicating liquor license for Schulte Catering Bloomington, LLC, doing business as Hyatt Regency Bloomington. Second. Motion by Council Member Beloga, second by Council Member Martin to uh, approve the new on sale intoxicating liquor license application for the Hyatt Regency Bloomington. Hearing no further discussion, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Bologa? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Loman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you much, Mr. Junker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Have a good evening. You too. With that, let's move on to item eight on our agenda, our organizational business. And item 8.1, which is the review uh, and uh, uh, ultimate approval, hopefully, of a term sheet for a cooperative agreement with Three Rivers Park District Partnership for the operations of Highland Greens Golf and Learning Center. Council, as you all know, it uh, we, we've been talking about Highland Greens for a number of years now, trying to figure out the best path forward on this. And uh, frankly, this looks uh, like a very exciting and promising opportunity for us in cooperation, in uh, direct partnership with some great partners with the, uh, the City of Bloomington, Three Rivers Park District. So I see that uh, Ms. Catry, our public work, or excuse me, our Parks Director is with us this evening. Good evening, Ms. Catry. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor, members of the Council. I'm here this evening to present a term sheet and resolution for a cooperative agreement with the Three Rivers Park District for the operation of Highland Greens Golf and Learning Center. With me this evening is Deputy Director Susan Foss and a special thank you to Three Rivers Park District Superintendent Bo Carlson and Three Rivers Park District Commissioner and Bloomington resident John Gibbs who are with us tonight to offer support for the partnership and to answer any questions that you might have. I have a brief presentation for you this evening, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions. First, I'd like to discuss uh, briefly the timeline. We've been on a very aggressive timeline for this partnership. I'd like to highlight a few key milestones. On December 7th of 2020, we hosted a meeting of City and Three Rivers Park District leadership. It was a WebEx with the Mayor, Council Members Beloga and Nelson, and City Manager Verbrugge, and Three Rivers Park District Board Chair John Gunyu, Commissioner John Gibbs, and Superintendent Bo Carlson. At this meeting, we discussed a possible partnership, and it was suggested that the idea go back to the full council and board for direction to proceed toward an operating agreement. At a city council meeting on January 11th, the council directed staff to work with Three Rivers Park District on a cooperative agreement. 
On February 3rd, we hosted another meeting of City and Three Rivers Park District leadership to review a draft term sheet. We had a great discussion and there were lots of excellent questions on both sides. Staff received support from the elected officials on the terms of the partnership. At the February 10th Park Arts and Recreation Commission meeting, the commission supported a cooperative agreement. On February 18th, the Three Rivers Park District Board approved the term sheet and draft cooperative agreement. And I'm here before you this evening for city council approval on the term sheet and resolution for the agreement. When we met with the city council on January 11th, the council requested significant community engagement on this initiative. Time was a factor as we wanted to ensure that if we reached an agreement that the Three Rivers Park District could open the facility on day one of the 2021 golfing season, which could be as early as March. We collaborated with a staff team from Three Rivers Park District and our co-ed division to develop a plan for engagement that would be both extensive and expedient. Community outreach began the week of January 25th. We sent an email to an entire golf database and the parks and recreation database. We utilized social media and next door. We advertised in the Sun Current and the Bloomington Public Schools Peach Jar email system. And we used Let's Talk Bloomington to conduct a community survey. The jointly crafted community survey opened on January 26th and closed on February 12th. It generated a total of 1,048 responses. Respondents were asked to provide their general thoughts and suggestions regarding the potential partnership. According to the sentiment summary produced via the text analysis tool in Let's Talk Bloomington Analytics Suite, 65% reacted favorably to the partnership idea. Of the remaining 34%, less than 5% had a negative reaction. The remainder were mixed or neutral. Examples of positive responses are, Three Rivers has a good reputation and track record. Highland Greens is an important community asset for youth and senior golfers. A couple of examples of negative responses are, the golf course is not needed and repurposing it would serve more residents. And a couple of examples of neutral responses are, I don't care who manages it, I just want it to be open. And I generally, I'm generally supportive of a potential partnership, but I'm also upset with the city's decision to close Highland Greens in 2020. Some of the highlights of the term sheets. The Three Rivers Park District has significant experience with these agreements as they currently have two such agreements with Hennepin County to operate Glen Lake Golf Course and Parker's Lake Golf Center. I'd like to quickly review some of the key points in the agreement. The term is for three years with an auto renew for three more years. A joint operation committee would be formed. This committee would consist of three staff members from the city of Bloomington, three uh, staff representatives from Three Rivers Park District, and one jointly appointed member by the city of Bloomington and Three Rivers Park District. The committee would review annual budget, fees, capital investment needed, marketing plans, and performance measures. Regarding capital planning, capital planning would be reviewed by the Joint Operations Committee. During the first three-year term, the committee will develop a plan for future needed capital improvements. The goal is to have no major capital investments in the first three-year term, but plan for the viability of improvements in the future after Three Rivers has had an opportunity to evaluate the site and the operation. Three Rivers will create a Highland Greens Fund. A fund of $150,000 from golf course revenues will be accumulated before any profits are shared. This would fund any needed repairs to the property in the first three years, and after achieving the $150,000 balance, revenues will be shared 30% to the city and 70% to the Three Rivers Park District. Regarding any potential operational deficit, the Three Rivers Park District fully expects to be able to run the facility at a profit while still providing reasonable rates and access for the facility. The district has far less administrative overhead charged to facilities than does the city of Bloomington. The district will maximize the driving range, bring a first tee program to Highland, and will offer robust lessons and leagues, as well as accommodating access for Bloomington Athletic Associations and user groups. However, if there would be an operational deficit, the Highland Greens Fund would first cover any deficits, 
And after that, the city and Three Rivers Park District would share deficits equally. For property rights, the city of Bloomington maintains ownership of the property. And for joint branding of the facility, like you see for signage at Normandale Lake, the city would be co-branded on signage at Highland Greens. The next steps, the city attorney's office would finalize the agreement based on the term sheet and the agreement would be executed by the city manager and mayor. And our staff would work very closely with Three Rivers Park District to ensure a very smooth opening of the golf course as soon as possible this spring. So with that, I would ask the city council to approve resolution 2021-2147, approving the term sheet for a cooperative agreement with the Three Rivers Park District for the management, operation and maintenance of Highland Greens Golf and Learning Center, beginning with the 2021 golf season and authorizing the mayor and city manager to fully execute the agreement. And with that, I would be happy to stand for any questions that you might have. Council, are there any questions? And I will say, Council, the uh, the way the screen is showing up here, I might not see your hand raised virtually. So if you do have a question, please wave your hand around a little bit as well, just to make sure I don't miss anybody. I see Councilmember Coulter, and then Councilmember Martin. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. I think I I got in just before the buzzer there for Councilmember Martin. Um, just a, a couple of quick questions. Um, so the the first one is is really just sort of a just so we're clear kind of thing, but um, reading over this term sheet, if this agreement moves forward, at least as it's laid out now, are there any, I mean, other than the sort of the deficit arrangement, that operating deficit arrangement that you mentioned, are there any other sort of other costs that the city would be responsible for? Ms. Gatry. Council Member Colton, Coulter, I apologize. Um, my my mind is spinning here, and no, I cannot think of any additional costs that the city would be responsible for. In fact, the Three Rivers Park District um, would like to get into Highland Greens uh, Clubhouse as soon as possible. They intend to invest some money to uh, to spruce up the facility, uh, things like replacing the carpet and paint. Um, and you know, get their computer systems in. So no, I'm not thinking of, of anything that the city would be on the hook for. Thank you. And then just one other quick question, sort of, sort of playing devil's advocate here. But you know, you, you talked about the the lower overhead costs and so on. And I guess my question is, you know, why why can't the city do what Three Rivers Park District can do as far as those things? Councilmember Coulter, I really believe that um, one of the main limiting factors for the city is the amount of internal service charges that the city of Bloomington has that the Three Rivers Park District just doesn't. That's one key piece of this. And the other key piece, um, as I know you are all aware, is the city or the facility is in a fairly significant need of capital investment. And uh, we're looking for a solid partner uh, that could potentially help us with those investments. Uh, and I think it's also worth noting that the Three Rivers Park District and, uh, and city staff is still interested in possibly pursuing a partnership with the Minnesota section of the PGA, if that would be a viable alternative moving forward. Uh, from both of our standpoints, we feel like it would be a win-win because uh, in that case scenario, uh, the Three Rivers Park District already has great relationships with a lot of the same uh, um, components in that uh, potential partnership, and they would be a wonderful operating partner uh, in that agreement as well. Thank you. And I, I sort of phrased that provocatively on, on purpose there, but um, I think it's really important to lay out sort of the really specific benefits to the city for this partnership. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you to staff for the presentation and also thank you, uh, Superintendent Carlson and Commissioner Gibbs for uh, making time to be here tonight. It's appreciated. Uh, I know just kind of harkening back to the before times uh, before COVID, there was a lot of discussion about Highland Greens kind of rebranding itself, uh, trying to get the word out there about golf maybe for a future generation. We talked about new logos and signage on the side of the road, all that. 
So I guess kind of in the broader uh, Three Rivers um, kind of landscape or ecosystem, what opportunities does that uh, provide us for kind of promoting the course and operations? Does that open up any challenges? I'm sure a lot of that has yet to be worked out, but kind of what uh, what's the 10,000 foot? Councilmember Martin, uh, do you would you like a response to that from the city's perspective, or would you prefer to hear from uh, Superintendent Carlson? Uh, either way. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll mention uh, a couple of things real quickly, and if uh, if Bo might be available to uh, to talk a little bit about any plans that they might have for uh, for marketing, branding, and those types of things, um, I could let him chime in. Um, I'll just say that I am very very happy to be participating in this partnership with Three Rivers because I feel like they are just a tremendous partner. And uh, they share such a, a shared vision uh, that the city of Bloomington does. Um, and in terms of branding and marketing and those types of things, those are things that would be worked uh, together between the, park, between the park district and the city of Bloomington in that joint operations committee. And uh, lastly, before I uh, turn it over to Bo, um, I would like to say um, we definitely see a need for um, an updated uh, appearance and brand for uh, for Highland Greens, and feel very com confident and comfortable that uh, Three Rivers would bring that. Bo, would you uh, would you have anything that you would like to add? Superintendent Carlson, good evening. Welcome. Thanks for being with us this this evening. Hello, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, that's a great question, and I can try to give a little bit of background. Um, so, one of the things that we really find appealing about Highland Greens. And it really is in kind of the whole approach that we have for golf. And we really recognize as an organization that the future of golf is connecting with youth. And if we build a strong youth and senior program, that'll feed into a whole lifestyle or lifetime of golfers that'll be playing with us in hopefully perpetuity. Um, and that's been our approach at Eagle Lake. That's been our approach at Glen Lake. Uh, that is our approach down at Cleary Lake all of which have very successful first tee programs, which is a national umbrella connecting kids to golf and creating golf opportunities for everybody. Um, we have a program where they can earn golferships and actually uh, have free, free or reduced fee golf opportunities to get them out on the course. And Highland Greens presents that same style course where it's really focused on youth development, youth education, uh, and then youth activity, actually getting kids out there uh, and playing and learning and enjoying the game of golf. So we, we're really excited about the opportunity within Highland Greens. It gives us an opportunity to market this course as part of our kind of bevy or suite of courses across the district and really um, cater to those audiences that have come to recognize the services and type of services that we provide district wide. Um, in addition to that, we're starting to see Glen Lake Golf Course, which has been a very popular uh, course and driving range that's on kind of the southwest side of the metro, right on the border of Minnetonka, Needham Prairie. Uh, we're almost or darn near capacity down there right now. So have the having the addition of a pretty good sized driving range, as well as another nine hole operation uh, is really very appealing for us. And it's an opportunity for us to have another location where folks can go. And while pre COVID or pre times that we're in here now, um, we were actually pretty sustainable from a golf standpoint as far as profitability um, and actually making those operations work. Then COVID hit and things went through the roof. Uh, I think it's very safe to say we had the best season in golf at all of our courses district wide in 2020 and there are no signs of that slowing down. Um, we're already way ahead in uh, our leagues that are signing up for uh, different league activities and lesson opportunities that are going on. Uh, and a lot of interest in some of the different programming things that we're already doing. So uh, we're excited that folks are refinding golf. And I think uh, that is going to be the case. As I said, we never saw a taper even right up to the last day of the season, uh, which was quite late this year. It was into uh, the first couple of weeks of November. Uh, and we still had very full tee sheets on very short days. So uh, we're excited about this opportunity. And I think um, this is going to be great. We're really looking forward to its success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Council, any additional questions? Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I've been fairly engaged in this process, so uh, I don't have a ton of questions. 
which may surprise everyone, but uh, the um, I just wanted to thank uh, our team, the Three Rivers Park District team, for working on this so quickly. And the, the couple questions I have is assuming this is something that the, the council wants to move forward with, uh, when do we expect it to happen for those people that are interested in being in a league that have been previously at Highland or maybe new people? Um, do they contact the city of Bloomington? Would they contact Three Rivers Park District? Just kind of, uh, can you help us look forward a little bit if, you know, uh, pending approval here, but if that moves forward, what is that process for people to um, get signed up for things? Council Member Nelson, I'll jump in real quick. And again, I'll toss it over to Bo if he has anything that he might add. Uh, but we have already been reaching out to um, our golfers uh, in our database very significantly. And we uh, plan with Bo's team to hit the ground running tomorrow uh, as soon as we receive approval from the city council to do absolutely every single thing that we can to help them get the golf course open on day one of golf in 2021. And uh, and we will. We will do anything that we can from from sharing uh, database information to uh, to getting key, keys to the facility. So I can, uh, I can sure, uh, assure the city council of that. Bo, anything that you would like to add? Just to reiterate the cooperation we've received from city staff has just been phenomenal. Uh, everything that we've talked about up to this point is how, to Ann's point, uh, how quickly we can make this transition and make it as seamless as possible. And, uh, you know, from our perspective, uh, the operation and the communication between the two partners really needs to be there. And I have no doubt that it will be there. Um, we'll need to, to really operate hand in glove with Dwan as well. Um, we offer an opportunity that Dwan doesn't have without a driving range. We would love for them to promote that Highland Greens is the place where they can come hit balls before they play their round over at Dwan. And we'll plan on doing the same at Highland Greens that folks that are looking for an 18 hole championship experience that Dwan is the home for them. So we want to ensure that we have that continued communication between the two parties. And I think that's going to really necessitate uh, the success for both courses long term is that we have that partner relationship. Well, thank you, and thank you in particular for the the last comment with regards to the continued partnership between the two courses in Bloomington. Here, um, that is fantastic to hear, and um, again, just appreciate all of the hard work in a short time period to make this happen. I know looking for partnership opportunities is something I've spoken to several times, and I think this is just. An absolute win-win for the, for the city, for Three Rivers Park District, for the community. Um, great way to provide and protect this amenity going into the future. Thanks again. Council, additional questions? I see we're joined by our Three Rivers Park District Commissioner, Mr. John Gibbs. Uh, good evening, Mr. Gibbs. Anything you'd like to add to the conversation this evening? Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. I see how full your agenda is, so I'm not going to belabor the point. Just thank you very much. I echo the absolute terrific spirit of cooperation that I've seen. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll ask the question that I asked, I think, in one of our preliminary meetings uh, for uh, Mr. Carlson or Mr. Gibbs or even Ms. Catry. Uh, how soon can we get the fence down? How soon can that go away and we can make it look better on Normandale Boulevard? Oh, we were talking about that today. You get to answer this one. Mr. Carlson, any ideas? Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you. You know, with approval of this agreement, as Ann said, we've been strategizing on how we can hand over the keys maybe as soon as tomorrow. And I would think it's uh, something that we would get on as quickly as possible. And I would see uh, no reason why that could not happen, at least to my knowledge. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Councilmember Belog, I see you uh, pushing buttons there. You're trying to raise your hand, or do you have a comment, question? Uh, I was, but uh, you know, it's a it's a disappointment that we have to join this partnership to do something as simple as take down a, a fence that should have been removed 20 years ago. I would agree with you, or at least plant vines. We should have planted vines 20 years ago. But good. Well, I'm uh, very excited at this possibility, very excited at this partnership, have seen the great work the Three Rivers Park District has done for 
for decades. Uh, you've all heard me tell my stories about uh, Cleary Lake and what a wonderful experience that I had growing up at Cleary Lake and uh, saw the f- fantastic work that uh, Three Rivers does. And um, just looking forward to an even stronger partnership between Three Rivers and the city of Bloomington. And I uh, want to thank both city staff and uh, as well as uh, our counterparts over at Three Rivers, both uh, staff and elected for the great work that they have done on this and to move this forward. So um, with that, Council, uh, if there's no further questions, I would look for uh, I would look for a motion on this. Uh, Mayor, I'd be willing to make that motion. Councilmember Nelson. Um, all right, I gotta find out my sheet. Uh, so I'd move to approve a uh, resolution approving the term sheet for a cooperative agreement with the Three Rivers Park District for the management, operation, and maintenance of Highland Greens Golf and Learning Center, beginning with the 2021 golf season and authorizing the mayor and city manager to fully execute the agreement. Full order, second. We have a motion by Councilmember Nelson and a second by Councilmember Beloga to accept the term sheet outlined in 8.1 for a cooperative agreement with the Three Rivers Park District and uh, Highland Greens Golf and Learning Center. Council, additional questions, comments? Hearing none, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Beloga. Uh, I'm certainly gonna vote aye. I've been waiting for about four to five years to do that. Uh, so most definitely aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Loman? Can't wait to get my uh, my hook shot over, over there, aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Looking forward to it, folks. Thank you very much for your work on this, and uh, very exciting to see this move forward. So I think it's uh, looking forward to great things. Supposed to be 50 by the weekend. I'm hoping before this month is up, it would be great to see this open and going. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. With that, we'll move to item 8.2. Uh, before, before we move to item 8.2, thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. Uh, Ms. Wilson, I believe we are done with public comment for the evening so we could release our operator. Could you please do that for us? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, Elisa? Hi, Chris. Hi, we are all done with public comment for the evening, so thank you for your assistance. You can go ahead and disconnect the line. All right, thank you, Chris. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for your help this evening. With that, we'll move to item 8.2, which is a, a review of a draft ordinance for a conversion therapy ordinance. And I believe Melissa Wurst Prasad is going to lead us off on this. And I know we also have members of our Human Rights Commission with us as well. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council members. I do have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, Chris, if I'd be able to get the ability to share. I can pull that up. There we go, perfect, thank you. All right, can everyone see the presentation we have? I think we're good to go. Wonderful, thank you. Um, So as was stated, I am the staff liaison for the Human Rights Commission, and I have been assisting the commission with their work plan item, um, which was to research conversion therapy and um, bring a recommendation forward to council. So returning tonight with me are HRC Chairperson Molly Bosu and Commissioner Anita Smithson with a draft conversion therapy ordinance, which was requested at the January 25th council meeting. Tonight's presentation will provide a short recap of last month's recommendation, followed by Deputy City Attorney Peter Zuniga, who will then walk through the draft ordinance components. And also available for questions is Angela Tona, a policy strategist from Outfront Minnesota, who has worked with the other Minnesota cities on their ordinances and legislative efforts at the state and can respond to any questions for Outfront. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Molly. Good evening, Chair Bosu. Welcome. Welcome back. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members. Good evening. And thank you for having us here again tonight to introduce the draft 
um, of conversion of the conversion therapy ordinance and to answer uh, any questions you may have this evening and also your questions that you brought to us on January 25th. So I'm just going to start out tonight by reiterating what conversion therapy is and the background that has led us to recommend an ordinance banning the practice for minors and vulnerable adults in Bloomington. Conversion therapy is any practice with the specific intent of changing a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. And this practice is based on the discredited and discriminatory belief that being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or any other expression of sexuality or gender is a mental illness and something that needs to be changed. Conversion therapy is not accredited or supported by any major medical or mental health organization. This practice does not work and is dangerous to the mental, emotional, and physical health of individuals receiving it. The conversion therapy ordinance that we'll be recommending tonight would ban conversion therapy by licensed practitioners for minors and vulnerable adults in Bloomington. We are gonna, we base this recommendation on professional opinions, human rights considerations, and the belief that it is the responsibility of government to protect the most vulnerable members of society. Um, next slide. So the professional opinions on conversion therapy firmly oppose the practice. Um, in addition to the four that organizations listed here on your screen, 24 other orga US organizations have denounced the practices. And core tenets of that opposition um, include the fact that homosexuality or identifying as transgender is not a mental disorder and therefore does not need to be changed. Attempts to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity are harmful and lead to adverse mental health conditions. Um, organizations advise that parents not subject their children to such practices and encourage legislation to protect against these practices. Next slide. Allowing conversion therapy practices to continue violates the rights of minors and vulnerable adults in our community. In defense of this belief, the United Nations Human Rights Council stated that conversion therapy is, quote, discriminatory in nature and degrading, inhumane, and cruel and creates a significant risk of torture. It called upon countries to take urgent measures to protect children and young people from these practices. And these statements link conversion therapy to a violation of human rights to call for a global ban of the practice. In many aspects of life, it is the government's role to protect the rights of children and vulnerable adults. And from a human rights perspective, we believe that this more than applies when it comes to conversion therapy. Next slide. So several Minnesota cities and US states have already taken this step to ban conversion therapy. And since we spoke on January 25th, Robbinsdale has also voted to protect the most vulnerable from this practice. Beyond this list that you're seeing on your screen, 20 U.S. states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico have also, also have bans on conversion therapy. Next slide. So at this point, we're going to shift our presentation in order to answer your questions from our January Council meeting. We really appreciated your engagement and inquiry at that meeting. Um, and so at this time, I am going to hand the presentation over to our Human Rights Commissioner, Anita Smithson, to walk you through our responses to these questions. Good evening, Ms. Misson. Welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, members of City Council. So um, the first uh, point that we want to address is your question with regards to opposing arguments. So organizations that oppose bans on conversion therapy often refer to their sincerely held religious beliefs as reason to allow conversion therapy to continue. In Minnesota, the Minnesota Family Council is the most prominent organization to formally oppose conversion therapy bans. Other opponents of conversion therapy bans often believe that being LGBTQIA is an illness and that gender identity and sexual orientation can be changed, despite there being no medical evidence to support this belief. Others who oppose conversion therapy bans feel that it's not the role of government to determine which types of therapy they can seek out for themselves or for their minor children. It is important to note that communities, including Bloomington, have a long history of establishing policy that protects the health and well-being of children and vulnerable adults. 
I will note, we received several letters from members of the community that oppose a ban on conversion therapy, and those are all included in your agenda packet this evening. Next slide, please. So will this have impacts for religious organizations? Very plainly, no. The ordinance language is well-defined and only applies to specific conduct by licensed providers and only applies to youth and vulnerable adults as defined by the state of Minnesota. While we know conversion therapy often occurs in faith communities or by faith leaders, this ordinance would not affect those practices. It should be noted, not all faith communities are opposed to this ordinance. They're not opposed to banning conversion therapy. In your agenda packet, you also have several letters from members of the faith community here in Bloomington who have expressed their support for this ordinance. Next slide. So are there adverse impacts for LGBTQIA people? The purpose of the ordinance is to protect LGBTQIA youth and vulnerable adults from a practice that's proven to be ineffective and shown to cause physical and emotional harm. The ordinance defines what conversion therapy is and what it isn't. The only people who will be adversely impacted by the ordinance are licensed providers if their conduct is in violation of the ordinance. And we know that many LGBTQIA people want to talk to therapists about sexuality, identity, and their own health. And this ordinance would provide them and their families the peace of mind that their practitioner is going to help them understand and grow into their full and authentic self. Next slide. So why an ordinance? Adopting an ordinance shows that the city of Bloomington takes their responsibility to protect the physical and mental health of LGBTQIA youth and vulnerable adults seriously, and is committed to policy that looks out for their health and safety. While a resolution is a really important value statement, and we use them often, um, it does not come with the enforceability that's required to eliminate the conduct in Bloomington by licensed providers. Next slide. So there was uh, questions and a little bit of discussion last time with regards to criminal versus civil citations. So in Minnesota, the communities that have adopted ordinances to ban conversion therapy have utilized the civil citation process. The criminal process would involve police department resources and the criminal reporting process can be really traumatic, exposing the conversion therapy survivor to investigations and legal processes. So filing a police complaint may actually be a deterrent for youth and would likely reduce the reporting of violations of an ordinance. Next slide. Um, the impacts in municipalities with bans in place. This one is a little difficult. We talked about it at the last meeting. Um, ordinances that protect LGBTQIA youth and vulnerable adults are relatively new to Minnesota, the first being in 2019. There are many challenges to understanding the prevalence of conversion therapy, as well as the impacts that the bans have had. As we've had conversations and performed outreach on the issue, many people were surprised to hear that this practice is still legal in much of the United States. And there is a general lack of awareness about local bans. A patchwork of local ordinances and general uncertainty about how to report violations contribute to not fully knowing the impacts that these ordinances locally have had. So creating awareness of the bans and education on how to make reports when individuals such as teachers, counselors, social workers, other mandated reporters, have a survivor share their experience is a big challenge, but I think one we can tackle. The Human Rights Commission will be seeking a reporting process similar to what the city of Duluth has. It's very important to the commission that the reporting process be trauma informed designed with input from members of the LGBTQIA community with an emphasis on youth and therapists who are experienced with LGBTQIA youth. Next slide. So why hasn't Minnesota enacted a statewide ban? Um, as Molly reviewed, 20 states and DC as well as Puerto Rico have enacted statewide bans. Um, in Minnesota, a ban was introduced in the Minnesota House and Senate in 2019. The bill was read in February of 2020, but no votes or further work was performed in part because of the COVID-19 pandemic. There is uh, the 2021 Mental Health Protections Act, 
which will be presented in the current legis legislative session um, in the next coming weeks, but passage is uncertain at this point. Next slide. Um, how would an ordinance impact a faith community or church renting space in a public facility? So the city has rental agreements at Creekside Community Center with churches over the years, and they have included a disclaimer on all promotions, including ads they placed in the Sun Current. Um, the ordinance that we are proposing has clearly defined um, who is a clergy member, who is a provider, and what the conduct is that's being regulated. And this is really about the conduct of providers, not the location um, that they're providing. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. I believe that uh, Peter will be presenting the draft ordinance uh, at this point. I just have a, a couple quick slides in summary. Oh, and then thank you, Molly. Will... Sorry. Yeah, no, of course. No problem. Um, yeah, so to reiterate, the Human Rights Commission is recommending that the City Council adopt a, a conversion therapy ordinance. And our recommendation is based on the professional advice from the medical and mental health community, and the belief that protecting children and vulnerable adults from this practice is an urgent human rights issue. This ordinance um, would protect our LGBTQIA youth and vulnerable adults from conversion therapy provided by mental health practitioners, which has been proven to be ineffective and harmful and, create, and to create a significant risk of torture. The ordinance does not impact parental rights. It limits the conduct or type of service which can be provided by licensed providers. We also believe that the ordinance would support the City Council's equity and inclusion strategic priority by showing members of the LGBTQIA community that they are welcome in Bloomington and that our city will act to protect their health and safety. And by joining other cities across Minnesota in enacting a strong civil ordinance at the municipal level demonstrates to our state that protecting our LGBTQIA youth and vulnerable adults from harm is a priority. Um, next slide. We have received several letters of support from the community, which are enclosed in the agenda um, packet. These letters of support reflect a very wide range of people and sectors of our community, including state of Minnesota legislators, social workers and therapists, parents and educators, and then clergy and religious leaders. Next slide. Um, oh yeah, so thank, so thank you once again for your time here tonight. And um, our deputy city attorney, Peter Zuniga, will now walk through the components of the draft ordinance. Well, thank you, thank Chair Bosu and, and Commissioner Smithson. Appreciate it. We'll get back to you, I'm sure, with questions here in a bit. But uh, Mr. Zuniga, good evening. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm going to go over the, the draft ordinance that is before you tonight. Um, the draft really can, contains five sections that can be broken down into findings and purpose, definitions, prohibited conduct, enforcement and civil penalties and severability. Uh, next slide, Melissa, please. The first section contains the city council's findings and purpose. These are really the reasons why the council would adopt this ordinance and what the, the purpose of the ordinance is. Uh, at the January 25th meeting and again tonight, you heard from the city, uh, the Human Rights Commission, of the reasons why they are proposing the city council adopts uh, an ordinance prohibiting conversion therapy. Um, those reasons, and I won't go into all of them, but those reasons are then incorporated into the findings of the ordinance uh, with the purposes to uh, really protect the physical and psychological well being of minors and vulnerable adults from the exposure to the serious harms caused by conversion therapy. And next slide, please, Melissa. The second section of the ordinance uh, includes the definitions that the uh, ordinance uses uh, within it. I won't go over all the definitions, but I do want to talk about a few of them. And you did hear a little bit from Molly and Anita, um, you know, that the ordinance has some pretty clear definitions of what is and what is not conversion therapy. Uh, first, the ordinance defines conversion therapy 
as any practice, conduct, or treatment for, by a provider that seeks to change an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. And this includes efforts to change or uh, behaviors or gender expression or to eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions or feelings towards individuals of the same gender. Uh, the key phrases in, in that definition are to change uh, and to eliminate or reduce. Um, and so really, when, we talk, when we're talking about what is conversion therapy, it is that effort to change someone's uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, the definition of conversion therapy also de uh, defines what it is not. Uh, it does not include mental health services related to trauma, uh, to sexual abuse, or sexual orientation or gender identity, as long as the services do not seek uh, to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, next, the ordinance defines what a provider is. Uh, we've defined it as a provider is an individual who is licensed, certified, or registered by the state of Minnesota as a mental health professional or practitioner uh, that provides mental health services. Uh, this includes physicians specializing in psychiatry, psychologists, marriage and family therapists, social workers, and other persons conducting or practicing uh, such mental health services. Uh, and some of the other cities that have similar types of ordinances, uh, in their definition of provider, they actually say what um, what a provider is not, uh, and that it does not apply to uh, clergy or religious officials. Uh, what we've decided to do is we've decided to make uh, clergy or religious officials its own definition, and you'll see a little bit uh, further down why we decided to do that. Uh, the definition that we've included in this draft ordinance uh, it's very similar to a, a definition that currently exists within state law. Uh, and this is that regulates uh, when a license is required to practice psychology. Um, in this definition, clergy or religious officials includes ministers, priests, rabbis, imams, Christian science practitioners, and other officials uh, that conduct counseling activities that are within the scope or performance of their recognizable religious domination or sect. Uh, if the religious official does not refer to themselves as a provider and the official remains accountable to the established authority of the religious domination or sect or their church, uh, then they will not be considered um, a provider and instead uh, they will be considered uh, a clergy or a religious official. Uh, next section, next slide please, Melissa. Uh, the third section is really what is the prohibited conduct. Uh, the draft ordinance makes it unlawful for a provider to conduct or practice conversion therapy on a minor or vulnerable adult within the city limits. Uh, what this section also does is it details exceptions to this prohibition. Uh, the prohibition does not uh, apply to members of the clergy or religious officials. Uh, so that's why it was important for us to specifically call out uh, religious uh, officials and clergy and define it so that people know that uh, where they are practicing it and, and what conduct is prohibited by the, the ordinance. Um, the ordinance also does not prohibit the, the practice of conversion therapy on individuals over the age of 18 and who are able to make decisions regarding their own medical or mental health. Next slide, please, Melissa. The next section covers uh, our enforcement and civil penalties. Uh, right now, as proposed, the city attorney's office will receive reports of alleged violation of the ordinance. Uh, the city attorney's office may then issue a warning letter uh, to the provider, notifying the provider that uh, conducting or practicing conversion therapy on a minor or vulnerable adult within the city is prohibited and requests immediate compliance with city code. The draft ordinance would also make uh, each instance or session of conducting or practicing conversion therapy on a minor or vulnerable adult um, a, a civil violation and, and enforced exclusively through uh, the city's administrative enforcement and a hearing process laid out in chapter one of the city code. Uh, the ordinance also does propose a civil penalty for violations and staff would be looking for your guidance on what to set those civil penalties at. Uh, our review of other jurisdictions 
and their civil penalties uh, kind of sets out that uh, $500 uh, for the first offense and $1,000 for subsequent offenses are generally what uh, other jurisdictions are, are using for their civil penalties. And again, this would be where staff would be looking for your guidance. Next slide, please, Marissa. The fifth and final section is on severability. And really what this means is that if a court that has jurisdiction over Bloomington uh, rules that any provision of the propose, proposed ordinance is unconstitutional or invalid, that the remaining portions uh, shall remain in full force and effect. Uh, so that's a, a quick overview of the ordinance, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and we would gladly stand for any questions or welcome any feedback that the council may have. Thank you, Mr. Zuniga, appreciate it. Council, questions on this? Council Member Lohman. Sure, yeah, I have a couple of questions uh, of Mr. Zuniga there. If we could go back to that section on the uh, clergy piece. Uh, so I wanna just be clear in my mind that if, uh, if you held a license uh, as a therapist, were conducting this and also were a minister, how does that work? I mean, I, I understand the way I'm reading it is that as long as you don't identify yourself as a licensed uh, practitioner, you're okay. Is that, is that correct? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman, uh, really there are, are two things that a, a person would need to do uh, within the definition of clergy or religious officials. Uh, one is, is to not hold themselves out as a provider. Um, and then also the official would have to remain accountable uh, to the church uh, or to the religious domination. And so as, as long as they are acting within their scope under the church, this, this ban would not uh, be applicable to them. So just for them having a license doesn't doesn't mean anything. So they could practice as long as they meet those two requirements that are listed in the ordinance, they'd be able to, to practice this on minors. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Loman, that is correct. And would just simply having a office with, you know, psychologists written next to it and then minister underneath it, does that violate one of those requirements that you've listed? Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Bowman, um, we would have to look further into that, but again, you know, there are two requirements in that definition and they would also have to be still within the, the under the authority of, um, of the church. I just want to have a better understanding of what that means because that, that seems, to me, just from this council member's point of view and perspective, a little bit vague uh, when it comes to, because certainly a person could, could be both a uh, religious person and also a provider. And I'm just nervous that the way that this is written, that that, that vagueness could get us into trouble. And I, I just want to be absolutely certain that, uh, you know, that both those requirements, if one of them is, is not met, that uh, it still would apply. That you wouldn't be Mr. Mayor, city of Bloomington. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Loman, uh, we can definitely create more clarity within that definition. I appreciate that. Um, then I wanted to turn to the uh, the enforcement uh, section um, of this, and I think the city manager has already uh, prompted you um, in regards uh, to one of the questions that I have uh, in terms of separating this out when we get ready to vote. Um, um, in terms of the uh, uh, of the ordinance? That's my first question. Then I've got some other questions I want to ask around enforcement. I'm, I'm sorry, Councilmember Loman, what was your question there? So my question is, is it possible to separate out the enforcement part of the ordinance? I remember we've done it in the past on other ordinances where uh, where we've uh, been able to, I just wanted to see if that is legal to do that uh, so that we could vote on two different portions of the ordinance. Um, I wanted to check on that. I, I didn't see that in the presentation. I know I did ask that uh, prior to the uh, to the meeting, but I'm gonna ask that now uh, because I'd like to know if uh, from a legal point of view that we can separate uh, uh, those two pieces out. 
Mr. Mayor and Council Member Bloman. Uh, I'm not aware of, of that being done, but I can definitely research that and look into that. Yeah, I'd appreciate knowing that ahead of time. Um, so then let's look into the uh, enforcement. I've just got some questions in terms of that. So when I hear the word uh, trauma and uh, I hear the word torture, and when I look to the rest of the, uh, uh, and certainly if you've got to do research on this, um, you know, it, it, that to me seems strange that that'd be a civil penalty. Um, uh, help me understand why that would be a civil penalty as opposed to a criminal uh, penalty. It seems to me that uh, the standard of law uh, relating to things where you have physical harm, and I saw this in the presentation, uh, that significant torture, physical and emotional harm, and then I also heard trauma. And, and that to me seems strange that that would be with a $500 fine, oh, this is my commentary here, or a $1,000 fine. It seems like that would be more in the sphere of a criminal type of offense. Help me understand why that would be from a legal uh, perspective, not uh, in, the, uh, in the criminal side of the, uh, of, the, of the sphere as opposed to the civil. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Loman, I think I would ask uh, Molly or Anita to weigh in on uh, why they wish for a civil. Oh, yeah, I, don't, I, I, I get where they're coming from on that point, but I'm asking from a legal perspective. Uh, when we look at those particular terminology, when we look at the other law, uh, certainly I, I, have, I hear the, the victim piece of it, and I, that's very clear to me. But I would like to know what, from a legal perspective, when I hear words like trauma, torture, uh, physical and emotional harm. You know, if I look at, if I were to look at a different crime, you know, or a different type of thing that takes place, I just want to understand from a legal perspective, where we fall with that when we look at our, just our code, you know, are there other things that would fall with those types of, of statements like that within the civil uh, uh, sphere of things? Just, just help me understand that from a, from a legal perspective. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman, uh, I am not a prosecutor. And so I don't know the, the standards that are needed for uh, trauma or torture, um, but we can definitely follow up with our, our prosecutor and get back to you. Yeah, I'd like to have that information as I'm looking at this, because I just, that's gonna, that's also gonna determine how I look at that, that, that monetary amount of 500 and 1,000, if that makes sense, or does this need to be on the other, other side of the, uh, of the equation in terms of being a, you know, a civil, uh, 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 you know, a, a crime, uh, not a fine. Um, so I think those are my my main questions. I certainly will have more, but I, I just want to uh, just kind of step back and let other folks get a chance to ask some questions. Thanks. I see Councilmember Beloga and then Councilmember Coulter. Councilmember Beloga. Councilmember Beloga, I believe you're still muted. Sorry about that. There you go. Uh, I had the same question about the uh, types of penalties, civil versus uh, criminal, uh, for the same reasons that Councilmember Lohman had. Uh, the terms that are being applied are quite severe, and yet we're going with a fluffy, excuse the expression, uh, penalty, uh, one that's monetary, and I don't find a um, a monetary penalty equals some of the um, items that are described as torture, uh, physical and mental abuse and damage, uh, trauma. I mean, there, there's not a, a statute on the books uh, today that I can think of that would use those same terms with a civil penalty. I may be wrong, but if I am, please correct me. Uh, so going then, who is out front Minnesota? It seems as if we've relied on some information from out front Minnesota, yet I don't know who they are, what their background is, what their expertise is. Uh, can someone help enlighten uh, all of us on that item? 
Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilmember Beloga. I will hand things over to Angela Tona, who's a policy, policy strategist from out front Minnesota who can speak about her organization and the work they do. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks for being here with us this evening. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, council members and staff and everybody else watching tonight. Um, my name is Angela Tona. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am uh, a policy strategist at Outfront Minnesota. We are a nonprofit that's been around for about 30 years, um, and we are an LGBTQIA plus advocacy organization. We've been supporting the LGBTQ community, like I said, for about 30 years on various issues. Um, we uh, we have a policy program where we support communities in passing policies that um, that progress LGBTQ rights, um, and we also have an anti violence program that's about 30 years old, where we support um, people that are LGBTQ um, that are survivors of trauma and survivors of violence. Uh, so yeah, I guess I could answer more specific questions, but um, for the sake of who is out front and what do we do, that's mostly what we do. But we also, you know, we, we support uh, schools, we support uh, different communities. We, you know, we're everywhere. We are the uh, largest LGBTQ advocacy organization in the state of Minnesota. Uh, Angela, thank you. Um, it's just a foreign name, so it helps to sure. gain some understanding about it. So uh, you said you're a nonprofit, and I would presume by that that you're a 401c6, a lobbyist group. Is that correct? Um, no, actually, we we have a few different organizations under our outfront umbrella. We have a 501c3, which is where we do our anti-violence work. Um, we also have a 501c4, um, which is uh, the work, which is where I am technically employed, which is where we do our policy and lobbying work. So. Uh, there is a lobbying section and and that's the part that you play. Yes, okay. that's correct. Thank you. Um, so it's been uh, presented that um, your organization has provided information that there are two uh, uh, therapists within Bloomington practicing conversion or repair uh, therapy. Um, how do we know that? That's a great question. Um, like I said, we, you know, we have an anti-violence program that supports survivors of violence. Um, I can't directly speak to uh, who those therapists are or how we know that information. I do know that, um, you know, we we learn information about what's going on in the community through our service with individuals, um, but we cannot. Um, uh, disclose that info like specific information uh, because of confidentiality. Um, we do provide social services, so so we can't um, fully disclose that information, um, if if that makes sense. And and also I'll say, you know, we we think that two is is far too many. Uh, I thank you for that response. So what what you're getting is is uh, um, information from people who are uh, using some of the counseling services or uh, talking to uh, other members of Outfront Minnesota about their experiences and may have said that um, they suffered uh, some kind of a, a, an experience that was not a positive experience in, uh, in their uh, view of it. Do you then investigate that, Angela, or do you take that uh, information as uh, factual? That's a great question. Um, I should also say that um, alongside our anti-violence program, we've also done uh, multiple surveys at um, different um, events um, where we just where we just do surveys of of, of, people, of participants of different activities. Um, obviously, pre-COVID, over the last couple of years, so we might have gotten that number um, from that as well. Um, we don't do our own uh, specific investigation um, because th there really is no path for justice currently in the state of Minnesota. Minnesota in cities that haven't banned conversion therapy. Um, we support people in filing complaints to licensed professionals uh, to, to their uh, licensing boards um, if they're interested in that. But we don't do specific uh, investigations because that's that's not really our scope. And also, there isn't really a path for that in the state of Minnesota currently. Um, but uh, but obviously, in cities that have banned conversion therapy, we do support people in fi in filing reports in those cities, and then the city will will um, conduct the investigation. 
and, and I apologize if this sounds like an interrogation, but it's okay. just uh, uh, merely I don't know how to ask information, you know, for factual information without having it come across that way. So uh, thanks yeah. for uh, bearing with me on that. Um, have you filed any um, complaints against uh, uh, boards who would uh, license therapists regarding uh, conversion therapy in Bloomington? Um, I have not personally, no, um, and I'm not, and I'm not completely aware of anybody that has. Um, I couldn't really speak to that, but I'm, I'm sure that it probably has happened within the last uh, thirty years or so. Uh, the final item uh, is, is uh, and I, I think I know the answer from you know the previous uh, discussion here, and that is is we really don't have any idea of how many people may have undergone, uh, you know. Uh, Counseling, if that's the right term to use, I'm struggling for the. Uh, I think phrase. conversion therapy is, is the right. Uh, yeah, is the right. Um, uh, right. In in Bloomington, over a, a, a given period of time. So is is that uh, um, that is accurate? Uh, I, I take it by your nodding affirmatively. Yes, I, I think it's a complicated, you know, it's a complicated thing because there really isn't one central way to support to uh, report. So we really can't know the direct answer. We know because of the, you know, number of survivors that have come forward that uh, that have received services in Bloomington um, and all across Minnesota. Um, we know because of, like I said, the surveys that we've conducted um, and the stories that people have shared. But uh, without, that's why uh, passing this ordinance is actually really important for understanding even where conversion therapy is happening and, and how and how frequent it's happening because Currently, there's no path for a resident of Bloomington or, or somebody who's receiving services in Bloomington to be able to report. Um, that would be, you know, you, you would have to go through all the different licensing boards to, you know, uh, to see if they've received um, complaints, which I think is mostly confidential, which is uh, really difficult to, to investigate. Uh, so passing this ordinance will actually give us a really good scope around who um, is experiencing conversion therapy because um, it will allow um, for a, a centralized reporting mechanism. So uh, you heard my comments earlier, and this is the last uh, item that I have, and I took far longer than I uh, had anticipated. So I, I appreciate the forbearance of all listening here. Um, but we talked about criminal and civil penalties. Would you like to weigh in on that issue? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think Melissa and Molly did a really wonderful um, did a really wonderful job of explaining. Um, I don't think that I have too much more to say besides, uh, you know, in working with survivors of violence, uh, uh, we know that survivors are much more likely to uh, to be able to work through. Um, to, to be able to work towards justice when they don't have to um, go through a process with the police. Um, we know that LGBTQ people have a very fragile relationship with the police, and um, and we know that uh, LGBTQ people are much more likely to report if they don't have to uh, go through that long process. Um, Further, I think I'll say, you know, that uh, I, I think that um, anti-violence legislation is moving much more in a restorative and transformative justice model, um, which does not include punitive criminal penalties and actually is moving more towards uh, penalties like people losing their licenses or people getting fines um, that are that are more civil. Um. I, I appreciate your comments. I will uh, disagree because uh, I, I kind of look at this um, and, and there's no good parallels to make on this, but spousal abuse, for instance, is something that uh, is, is very frequently a police involvement and goes through the criminal process. And it, it has a lot of the same characteristics that have been uh, applied in this uh, description, 
of physical and emotional abuse and harm, uh, torture and trauma. So uh, I'm just really trying to grasp all of this. And uh, at the end of the day, I would uh, really like to have had a, uh, uh, a professional, a licensed professional uh, who practices in this area, you know, of, of uh, uh, counseling, uh, one who speaks for this subject and one against who could, you know, give us some real time and personal experiences. Um, uh, otherwise, I feel like I'm not making fact-based choices here. I'm making more emotional choices in the process of this. So uh, again, thank you all for uh, your information and uh, uh, providing me this time. Councilmember Coulter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to, to sort of start off here and, and um, I, I just kind of want to uh, put an offer to uh, my council colleagues while also obviously being careful about uh, not violating open meeting law um, that I have had uh, other conversations with uh, other folks at Outfront and I can I can speak if folks are interested um, to some of the specifics I think that that council member Beloga raised and and specifically how this would apply in Bloomington. So I uh, just wanted to put that offer out there. Um, my first question is either, I guess, for, for Molly or Anita, um, you referenced a, the, the Human Rights Commission's recommendations uh, to, to adopt this ordinance. And I, I just want to uh, clarify here, was, was there any disagreement or dissent voiced uh, by any members of the Human Rights Commission when discussing this? Um, thank you. Uh, Council Member Coulter. Um, so we began discussing this um, last spring, I believe, um, or maybe even a little bit before that. Um, and in my recollection, and Melissa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, in our my recollection of our discussion, um, we did have, um, we've had some turnover in commissioners since then. And so in our original discussion, we were in full support of it. It was a unanimous decision to um, look into researching conversion therapy. Um, and I cannot remember any dissent um, within our commission. That, that's fine. It's a perfectly good answer. I just, I, you know, I don't know that you took an official vote or anything like that. So just wanted to um, get some clarification on that. And then uh, my next sort of series of questions probably would best be answered by Peter, um, just sort of around some of these definitions, because I, um, I, I think, you know, some of the concerns certainly that I've been hearing from folks are about really what I would describe as unknowns, as sort of um, confusion or, or even fundamental misunderstandings about what this ordinance, this proposed ordinance would do. Um, so I'm wondering, Peter, first, if you could just talk through a little bit about sort of the origin of um, the definition of conversion or repair, reparative therapy and, and kind of how that particular construction uh, came about. And if there are other folks who can add to that, that would be really helpful too. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Coulter, maybe Molly or Anita can talk a little bit about the origins and then I can talk a little bit about how this definition uh, made its way into this particular uh, draft ordinance. Mayor and council members, I'm happy to take this one. So the organization, uh, the Human Rights Campaign, which you may recall the Municipality um, Equality Index, they do have some model legislation. Um, there are other communities, um, you know, in Minnesota and outside of Minnesota that have sort of standardized, sorry, my two-year-old, um, that has sort of standardized um, you know, the, the language. Um, so you know, not really recreating the wheel from city to city in Bloomington, which I think would help quite a deal if the state were ever to um, enact a statewide ban because cities can help um, with the fine and the research part of it, but then there isn't a different definition in every community. So um, that is how, you know, we came to get some of these definitions that are in 
the ordinance when we were working with um, Peter and staff on that. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Coulter, if I could just add, uh, like Anita said, you know, there are model ordinances out there. Uh, we do have the benefit of other cities within Minnesota that have adopted ordinances. And so this definition of conversion therapy doesn't stray too far from those uh, other examples. Um, but in my comments earlier, you know, I did highlight that some of these other jurisdictions uh, include the exception um, for clergy and religious officials within the definition of conversion or reparative ther therapy. Um, and so what we did is we actually pulled that out uh, and specifically created a definition for clergy or religious officials. Uh, and then what we also did within the, the prohibited conduct is we specifically also called out that the, the prohibition does not apply to religious uh, officials or clergy. And some of the other ordinances that we have looked at did not have that. Thank you. I, th I think that's um, really important information. And then um, you actually sort of anticipated my next couple of questions here because the definitions both for uh, clergy or religious officials and for provider site, site excuse me, um, Minnesota state statutes, uh, specifically 148.9075 and 245.462. And I'm wondering um, if you could just give a, a sort of a brief explanation about what those uh, what those chapters of statute refer to and, and why those specifically are cited. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Coulter, uh, for the definition of clergy or religious officials, uh, we did cite that, uh, that statute because it already had, you know, really this kind of, this definition. What this statute does is it uh, regulates psychologists uh, within Minnesota, and uh, the statute created an exemption when um, when clergy or religious officials did not need a license uh, to provide counseling services. Um, and again, you know, looking at other models that are out there, um, you know, this was a really good definition within state current state law um, that defined what a what a member of the clergy or religious official is. Um, and so we found that to be beneficial as we help to try to create some clarity within our statute. Um, the, the definition provider also cites to, to current state law. Um, and really this section of statute, um, you know, is, is re really related to the Department of uh, Human Services. And again, um, you know, this is going back to, we have these models out there um, that provide some really good clarity for us and, and not trying to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. I, I think, like I said, I think that's really important in terms of uh, sort of clarifying, um, you know, who this proposed ordinance would apply to and, and perhaps just as importantly, who it would not apply to and, and you know, how it affects um, the work that, that folks do. Um, and then the, the last questions I have, and I'm not honestly sure who's best to, to answer this, um, go back to, you know, what, what some other folks have raised about the enforcement section. And, um, you know, I, I think just sort of by way of initial comments, I've been thinking a lot about the civil versus criminal discussion since we had it at our last meeting. And, um, you know, I, I think this to me seems to be one of those cases where, you know, it, it's not just sort of the the severity or the the potential pain inflicted by what this would mean, but what is most likely to result in a change of behavior. You know, and, and we know, for example, uh, you know, Council Member Beloga mentioned spousal abuse. And, and yes, that is a, a serious issue. It is a criminal issue. Uh, but we also know that reporting spousal abuse is a really, really, it's a really big challenge. And it, it, it can be very tough for spouses who are abused uh, to, to get them to come forward precisely because of what's involved in the criminal process. And so you know, I, I think all things being equal, um, you know, I certainly would much prefer to sort of throw the book at folks, um, but I think we need to recognize what's really going to have results. And, and so I, I think, you know, for, from my perspective, um, you know, I, I, based on what we have heard, I, I think the civil approach is probably the, the better one. But um, my question is um, how, sorry, my phone. 
um, how, so it, it references uh, receipt of a report of an alleged violation. And I, I think Anita, you spoke to this, that, that it sounds like sort of the process for reporting this is still, uh, would, would be as, as if this were to, if this ordinance were to be adopted would be sort of under development. And would we, I mean, would we need to amend the ordinance to provide for that once that process is completed? Um, and let me let me ask just all my questions first, and you can you can then I'll be done. Um, is there my other question is um, how how would this be, you know, recognizing the challenges? How would it be investigated? I guess um, you know we we you know are we well yeah I'll just put it that way. How how would this be investigated? Because I think some folks have have sort of raised the question: you know, Are we going to be you know sending police officers to individual counseling practices or, or something like that. Um, and yeah, so the, I guess I would say those are my questions. I'll, uh, thank you, Councilmember Coulter and Mayor and other members of council. I'll just add from the conversations that I had with staff in Duluth and um, Red Wing and Winona, they had adopted their ordinances and then we're working on that reporting mechanism, whether it's an online form, um, whether they were gonna choose to try to get youth connected um, with uh, counseling and therapy um, as part of that reporting process. Um, so I will let Peter respond to whether or not the ordinance would need to be um, changed. But from the research that I did with other cities, the majority have passed the ordinance and are working on the um, getting the reporting mechanism in place. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Council Member Coulter, uh, I don't think the ordinance would need to be changed uh, for the reporting structure. Um, I think we can can work closely with our communication staff and community engagement to, to develop a, a reporting structure that, that works for, for individuals to report alleged violations to the city attorney's office. Uh, from the investigation uh, standpoint, uh, right now the, the draft proposes that this is a uh, subject to the administrative enforcement and hearing process within chapter one of the city code. Uh, you know, the, the city code lays out, lays out a process of how we try to resolve uh, civil issues within the city. Uh, that first starts with an administrative conference uh, with the city attorney's office, um, where we try to resolve the dispute. Um, if we are unsuccessful at that, we can proceed to a, a hearing with an independent hearing officer. Uh, the procedures at the hearing is that uh, each party should have the oppor opportunity to present testimony and question witnesses. Um, we would have the ability to subpoena documents. So there is some investigation uh, procedures already built into city code. Okay, that's. I think that's important for, for folks to know that that, that that process does currently exist uh, within our city code. So um, I would, I would, my only other comment as far as enforcement would um, I guess probably more apply to the the reporting mechanism, but I think we want to uh, make sure that that to the greatest extent possible um, that that any reporting structure has anonymity associated with it. That that folks uh, that folks can report violations of this ordinance anonymously. I think that's going to be a really important piece to this. So thank you, Councilmember Carter, and then Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I just want to thank our Human Rights Commissioners for all the work that you and the rest of the Commission and City staff have done. Um, all of the information um, that was pre presented here tonight is super helpful, and I really appreciate that you very explicitly answered all of the Council's questions from the last conversation. Um, so I guess I just wanted to be clear. Is there any, so I'm a public health person, so I love like literature reviews and all that fun stuff. Is there any empirical evidence that suggests that conversion therapy is effective and, and like a healthy um, way to help counsel um, individuals? Like any? Not that we were able to find and according to the American Psychiatric Association that there is not any such research available that scientifically demonstrates that it's an effective therapy. Okay, and then there is empirical research that demonstrates and shows that it is ineffective and it's dangerous. Yes, that's my understanding from what we've seen. demonstrated that tonight. And are there any professional psychological, psychiatry, pediatric 
medical associations that endorse conversion therapy? Not that we are aware of. Okay, so this could be part of the reason that it's hard to get an alternative viewpoint on the effectiveness mm -hmm. and the, the benefits of conversion therapy. Is that fair to say? I would say yes, that's definitely fair to say. And I'll let Anita, Molly, or Angela, if you want to um, rein in. But I will say even just you know trying to research effectiveness of conversion therapy, and you will get an entire slew of sources that talk about how it's ineffective, not proven, it does not, um, you know, it's not a mental illness and you'll see, you know, testimony from survivors and it, it's difficult to find um, the counter argument. We did, um, as you saw in the packet, um, there were some residents who um, did have some information that they provided as sources. Um, but uh, speaking for the Human Rights Commission, as their liaison, they were really looking at sources um, that are, you know, highly reputable and recognized and um, accredited, like the American Medical Association, Psychiatric Association, along with numerous others, um, counseling associations, and so forth. Um, so thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and then how many um, organizations, um, medical, um, psychiatric, how many in, have denounced conversion therapy? Is it 24, you said? It's actually over 24. Um, I on GLAD's website, they've done the research. So in addition to the four that we've listed, um, that also included the United Nations Human Rights Council and the World Health Organization. Um, but they had listed uh, 24. Okay. So I just, I guess, I just want to say that I really appreciate the the due diligence that you all have done in in really digging in and looking at the alternative um, opinions, um, but really basing your recommendations on the science and the recommendations from the medical community. Um, like council member Bologa said, this is a super emotionally charged topic. I know that it is. Um, but as a parent with young kids, um, with friends who have children who identify as transgender or gender nonconforming, um, I know that this is an important topic in our community and that, um, and that when I've talked with parent, other parents, they're shocked that it's still allowed. Um, and so, again, I just, I want to thank you all so much. Um, one question I did have um, related to the, the civil versus um, criminal, is there a way to, um, and I, and I quite honestly, I'm not totally sure where I stand on this at this point, um, but could we have it um, kind of staged? So like the first offense is civil and the second offense would be criminal, or could we do something like that? Mr. Mary, Council Member Carter, we can certainly look into whether we can do something like that. Okay, awesome. I have no more questions. Thank you all so much. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just got a few questions here just to clarify. Um, in terms of the question between civil and criminal, um, the other cities in Minnesota, the other states that have passed uh, laws and the proposed Minnesota legislation, are all of those um, civil actions or do any of them have a uh, criminal offense? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Nelson, uh, all the ordinances and, and laws that I've seen have made it a civil penalty and not a criminal violation. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things I heard earlier was uh, part of um, victims sometimes seeking justice is that they would file complaints to the whoever licenses um, the therapist and uh, that that uh, sometimes happens. Currently, uh, if someone in Bloomington filed a complaint, uh, what would happen? And would that change if it was not just a complaint about having um, undergone this type of therapy, but if it was also a violation of a city ordinance. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Nelson, could you please re repeat your question? Uh, yeah, so if if an individual filed a complaint to the licensing board uh, for therapists, or what would happen currently today? And would that change if that was also a violation of city ordinance. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Nelson, um, I'm not aware of, of what steps the licensing authority would take, uh, but right now under the draft ordinance, um, you know, and certainly open, um, you know, welcome your feedback. Uh, 
if the city attorney's office um, does find a violation, right now we will report that violation and the details surrounding that violation to the appropriate licensing board or authority. So I, I guess the, the heart of my question is, uh, and one, I appreciate that that would be reported. I think I think that's good. But the heart of my question is, does it give the state licensing authority um, additional tools against that license? Because um, I, I work in a licensed trade. If somebody filed a complaint with there because they didn't like something, that's very weakly enforceable versus Here's a specific violation of a law that this company committed. That is something the state can much more easily um, uh, enforce as an action against that license. Uh, and I'm just wondering if that is an accurate understanding or um, if that's been seen played out in other communities. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Nelson, uh, I'm not aware of that. You know, I can certainly look into it. Uh, but maybe Melissa can talk about how how it's played out in other communities. Okay. Uh, that uh, thank you, Peter and Councilmember Nelson. That's something that we would have to do additional research and bring back to you on. That I'm not aware of what the um, response has been if reports are made to state boards that do have an ordinance within their city. Um, I'm not sure if Angela, if you're familiar with anything. Um, it, that you have to add. Otherwise, we certainly can do uh, research on that question. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then uh, uh, just to help me understand the fine schedule, it said it was per session. So if a uh, minor was taken to uh, this type of therapy weekly for two months, so eight times, that fine would be 5,000 for the first one. Or 500 for the first one, 1,000 for this next seven. So it'd be 7,500. Is, is my understanding that correctly? It's Mary Council Member Nelson. Um, yeah, it would be for each session um, that where the, the provider would be engaging in this practice or conduct. Um, you know, I would say right now, you know, we have, haven't uh, set. The fine schedule yet and so we're looking for your direction on that uh, typically civil fines don't exceed uh, two thousand uh, dollars in total uh, but we can certainly look in into that and certainly as uh, you provide uh, guidance on what that fine schedule would be as well okay i just wanted to uh understand how it's kind of proposed at this point um so thank you for that that's that's the clarification that i needed uh, appreciate it Thank you, Council Member Nelson. So I've got a couple of questions just in the, in the broader context of this ordinance and what we're trying to accomplish here. And, and as I see under the, uh, under the findings and agree with it, uh, letter F, it says it's necessary for the city council to exercise its legislative power to protect and promote the health, safety, and welfare of the city's minors and vulnerable adults. And we do that. I mean, we do that most obviously in uh, our tobacco ordinances and, and the, the vaping ordinances that we've passed. So we, we have that, we have that stated as something that we, we want to do, but what is it, how does that fit in the broader scheme of things? And so Mr. Zuniga, maybe you can answer this or some others. So um, and as I look at this, uh, parents or vulnerable adults, what if, what, if, uh, what if parents or guardians, parents of these children or guardians of a vulnerable adult, what if they deny the people that they're taking care of? What if they deny them care in some way or subject them to harmful care in some way what what does state law say about that in terms of is that doable can can they do that kind of thing can they can they turn down medical care in and and instead opt for you know something else what what's the line on that mr mayor council members uh right now currently under state law uh, minors are unable to consent to receive medical or mental health services. And so it's the parent that does have to consent. Uh, but there are limited circumstances where a minor can uh, consent or refuse medical care. Um, you know, certainly if uh, there are court cases out there where parents refuse uh, necessary medical treatment, uh, where doctors, um, you know, do have the ability 
to go get a court order to require that medical care. Um, and then there's also a long list of, of mandatory uh, reporters uh, on abuse as well. Um, so, so those instances uh, can be discovered as well. So, and, I, and I'm not and then, saying, you know, go ahead. And in those cases, the ability, the state does have the ability to, to take over and protect the interests of and, and health and safety of the, of the minor or vulnerable adult. Okay. So it, it, it is, and, and whether it's, it's either denying treatment or, or subjecting to excessive or treatment that has been shown as harmful. For example, instead of, you know, instead of giving a vaccine, we're going to put, we're going to put leeches on you, that kind of thing. So it's a, it's, it's a, if it's a, if it's an obviously harmful practice to be applied, that, that, that there is some sort of state guidance on that. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. And are, are, are religious beliefs a defense for denying treatment to a child? Mr. Mayor, I have, uh, there are court cases out there that, that talk about uh, religious beliefs. Uh, denying a child uh, medical care. Um, and then there, you know, depending on the jurisdiction, there are some court cases that, um, you know, will order the, the medical care despite the religious belief. Um, but again, those are, are decisions up to the court in those cases. Got it. So, and, and, and I'm asking these questions just because, I mean, as we state this here, we're saying that what we're looking to do is promote the health, safety, and welfare of the, of the city's minors. And I guess it's it's a, our decision, our uh, direction as to exactly how to do that and what that means. You know, if, if do we do we try and legislate something that would prevent uh, something that has not been accepted, that is is repudiated by medical practitioners and professionals, as far as we can see, and we can't find the other side from a medical practitioner standpoint. And uh, uh, and and even if we can't. Uh, do that legally if we if we're not able to to really take that on whether it's through state statute or through uh whatever we're trying to accomplish here um whether it's not is it the right thing to do or is it the is it the legal thing to do and, and i'm trying to to work through that in terms of what we're we're trying to accomplish here and um and i and i also uh just just thinking what what is the age of uh, you mentioned mr zuniga the the um the many layers that I know are in place for in, in social service protection of, of minors in a variety of different ways and, and vulnerable adults as well. But what is the, um, can you help me here? What is, what is the age of consent or ability to, to, to bring a complaint, to bring a lawsuit against an organization that uh, if a minor felt they had been wronged by something, do they need parental consent? Do they need, do they need uh, consent beyond uh, they're 18 years, obviously, as a minor, they're, they're not able to, to do many things. Can, as a minor, can they, can they bring a lawsuit against an organization that they think they've harmed them in some way? Mr. Mayor, council members, uh, typically the, the age of consent is 18 years old. Uh, in limited circumstances, the minor uh, can be considered an adult. Uh, but for the purposes of, of bringing a lawsuit, uh, typically it's, it's uh, brought uh, by an adult acting, you know, on the benefit of the minor. On behalf of the minor. Okay, that makes so, sense. Yeah. Okay. And so, it, which might help to explain why if we haven't seen lawsuits or complaints, it's because a minor bringing them forward, and if a parent uh, decided that this, uh, this treatment was best for them in the first place, that parent obviously wouldn't sign off on it and bring it forward. It would be up to the minor to try and find a trusted adult to do so, which might be difficult in a number of different situations. So... Council, do we have any additional questions specific to the ordinance that we're talking about here? We're talking about a lot of different things tonight, and we're well over an hour into our discussion already, and it's been a good discussion. But let's uh, let's try and give staff a little bit of direction here in terms of what we're trying to see, what we would like to see in this ordinance, how we would like to see this all structured. So um, as we work to, to, to move this along and, and wrap this forward, uh, try and, if you could, direct your questions, your comments, your uh, your um your suggestions specific to the ordinance. Councilmember Lohman. I will do that, Mayor. Thank you. I did have one other question, and, uh, uh, and it doesn't have to be answered right now. I'd just like to see a written response. I'm looking for, uh, in the public space, have we seen any uh, 
ordinances out there that have restricted uh, when uh, when organizations utilize public spaces. So, for example, if they were to utilize our community center, uh, we just say, nope, you can't do that. Whether can we write that into our contract? Can we prevent them from from doing that, even if it is a uh, religious? Uh, uh, type of thing because they're utilizing the public space. Um, uh, what does the law say about that? Not necessarily looking for a response now, but I'd like to have a response for that when we get towards the uh, uh, <clears throat> the actual uh, uh, passage of this or non passage of it, whichever we decide to do. Um, so then, from it, my it, Councilmember Loman, if I could just uh, if I could just jump in for just a second, uh, Mr. Zuniga, I think you do have some insight on this for you for us. Do you not? I do, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Loman. Um, in my research, I haven't come across an ordinance uh, or a policy that that limits, you know, in particular conversion therapy in public spaces. Um, but when we're looking at it from our perspective and and how religious organizations are, are using our space, um, you know, the the, fr the First Amendment provides us guidance, um, and that you know the the city shouldn't be uh, favoring or disfavoring uh, one religion over, over another. Uh, and certainly if, um, you know, we are, are ex excluding uh, clergy and, and religious organizations from this practice, um, you know, we would have to look at whether we could then prohibit them from doing this within uh, our contracts or our leases. But we can do further research and get back to you, Council Member Lemon. I would like to, to look at that. Uh, it's just when we start utilizing public space that that's, you know, I, 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 we're, we're talking about vulnerable adults and abuse and that type of thing. I'd hate to have the, the public space to be uh, uh, utilized in that in that fashion uh, uh, to abuse an individual. We talk about the purpose of our uh, 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 of our uh, ordinance. And so I just, I think it's worth the scope and of looking at that just to make sure we're doing everything we can do uh, as it relates uh, to that aspect of it. Um, in respect to the enforcement piece, I'm wondering if there's a way to look at uh, a couple of different, uh, uh, two or three ways uh, to bring that ordinance back. Uh, you know, with, I, I like the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, maybe a graduated piece where you start off with some fines. Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, 1,000 the first one, 2,000 the second, and then it's criminal. Um, or um, I think the out front uh, representative had mentioned, the policy expert had mentioned something around the idea of restorative, where you eliminate their license. And do we have that ability to eliminate, I think it's a state license, uh, to be able to practice in the city of Bloomington? I'd, I'd be curious about that, if there's a way to, to, to do that. So just looking for different ways in which uh, to, to maybe, maybe it's a combination or maybe uh, Know, uh, the staff could decide what they wanted to do with it uh, uh, to be able to enforce it. So that'd be what I'd, I, I'd suggest um, on that. I think that's all I'm going to comment on. I want to make sure the council members are able to comment. Thank you, Councilmember Loman, and I think that's kind of where we are in, in terms of outstanding issues regarding this. I think we have we need to at least come to nodding consensus what we want to see uh, the staff bring back in the ordinance uh, in terms of I think penalties are the big thing that we have. Um, and I do think, Councilmember Loman, I don't know that the city can uh, suspend or ban a, a, a state license. I just don't see there's any way that we could possibly do that. But uh, in terms of, of penalties, whether it's uh, civil or criminal, um, I, I'd, I'd look to you, Council. Uh, how do we how do we want to address this? We've heard from a couple. Uh, we, we've had a couple of uh, opinions and suggestions that this should be a criminal offense. We've heard uh, the counter that it's more. Uh, logical and, and more manageable as a civil offense. And so I'd, I'd look for some consensus from the council of which direction we want to go with this and then how we want to, how we want to address this because we, uh, as I said, we, we, the goal here is to give staff enough to work with to bring back a, an ordinance for us to uh, have a public hearing on uh, in the, the near future. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I sort of alluded to this earlier, but I, I guess I'll just sort of reiterate my comments that, um, you know, I, you all know I'm not necessarily a fan of, well, every other city does it this way, so we should do it this way too. Um, but I think the fact that, I think Mr. Zuniga said literally every city ordinance crafts it as a, a civil violation. Every, and I, am I correct that every state law that you've seen as well, it's a, a civil action, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, and again, given the the concerns and and I would say informed opinions that you know we've heard from our human rights commissioners and and based on on Angela's nodding head when I was speaking earlier, um, I I you know again I I think in in a perfect world a criminal action might well be something we could pursue, but I I think given sort of the to borrow a legal term the totality of evidence that I've seen. Um, I, I think a civil action is is just the preferable option. Um, I think, you know, the state, if it ever moves forward on something like this, can make a different decision. But um, I, I just, I think, based on everything I've seen, sort of taking everything into consideration, um, that would be my preference. As, I mean, as far as the, the dollar figure of the fines, um, you know, I, I, unless I sort of misunderstand our process, that to me feels like something we could amend at a public hearing um, if we decide that the number that staff comes back with is is not uh, not the number that we want to go with um, and go from there. But I that would be my preference at this point. And I would have to agree with you, Councilmember Coulter. Given as you said the preponderance of evidence and what we've seen in front of us, um, it just it it may make the most sense. Now, it might not be the most perfect solution, but I think it may make the most sense given what we have in front of us. Council, any additional feedback on that? If none, can I at least get uh, four nods saying that this is the way we want to go with this? All right. So the, uh, the staff will, uh, if you could draft up the ordinance in that way using the civil penalties as we've discussed. Uh, Councilmember Lohman and then Councilmember Coulter. Councilmember Lohman. Briefly, if there is a way then uh, if we're going that route to uh, allow uh, those folks who want to vote the other way uh, have that ability. So if that could be separated out, if that could be looked into, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> and we'd have to take a look at that, Councilmember Lohman. I'm not sure that that I suppose it's doable, but we, we might want to take a look at whether or not we want to do that. So I, I appreciate that comment. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. I guess my, my question is more just a process question. I know obviously there is a great deal of interest around this, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if staff could give us a, a rough estimate of when we might expect a public hearing on this. Mr. Verbrugge, any ideas? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I think that there's uh, a relative consensus here and not a whole lot of reworking of the ordinance that needs to occur. I think that we can move to publication relatively soon uh, so that we could have a public hearing in April. Council Member Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I still advocate that uh, the kinds of crimes that we're talking about uh, are uh, criminal rather than civil. Uh, understand uh, some of the comments about uh, characterizing these as civil. Uh, but just because all that went through us uh, before uh, had so much timid, you know, uh, timidity that they did not uh, uh, choose to go to the criminal state. Um, I think that Council Member Carter had an interesting suggestion of the first one or two uh, are civil and then it becomes criminal. Uh, boy, if this is my child or grandchild, um, it's certainly criminal. And that's how we should look at all of these uh, as if they are our children or grandchildren, as opposed to uh, you know something in the abstract here. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I just want to say that I'd support that graduated uh, mm -hmm. structure that that provides that after multiple offenses. And um, I did appreciate the answer earlier that if there is an offense, even at the civil, that it goes uh, in a sent to the uh, licensing authority. Because um, I think ultimately my hope would be that that license would be revoked, so they can't practice this uh, anymore, uh, whether in Bloomington or anywhere else in the state. Councilmember Martin, I saw your hand up briefly. Uh, I appreciate the graduated approach as well. 
So do we have a new nodding approach to a graduated approach? Um, Mayor and council members, I'm sorry, I know this is normally not where a speaker uh, jumps in. Um, I don't know if you can do that, and I guess that would be something that um, city legal staff would need to look into. I know that communities are preempted from, um, like municipalities are preempted from like removing someone's state license, but they are not preempted from providing a civil fine to somebody who is licensed by the state for doing something that um, is against an ordinance. So I'm not sure that you can do the, the civil and criminal. I think um, I don't, you're not preempted from taking action on a municipal level for a civil ordinance. I, you may be preempted from a criminal standpoint with regards to like putting someone in jail, for example. So um, I don't know that you can do that graduated approach. And I'm sorry that I jumped in in a oh. place that is not typical for a presenter to do so. I appreciate the input, uh, Commissioner Smithson. And we will ask legal to take a look at that. And, and if it is a possibility, we will consider it. And if we can't, we cannot. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge, do you have anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I was just going to reiterate that, uh, as Mr. Zinniga said, we will uh, research that issue. Uh, and uh, when we come back with the draft uh, or with the ordinance language for consideration, um, if, it is, uh, if it is permissible, uh, we can either, we'll, we'll discuss at staff whether we build that in or if we provide it as an option for the council to adopt at the time. Um, but we'll make sure the council uh, has a full understanding of that when it comes back. Thank you. Council, anything more on this? I think we've chewed this up pretty good for tonight. And we will have a public hearing on this, uh, I believe, sometime in April. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chair Bosu, are you still with us? I, I believe I saw you. There you are. Yes, Chair Bosu, Commissioner Smithson, and uh, Miss uh, Miss Tona. Thanks for being with us this evening. Appreciate it. Melissa, thank you very much for your work guiding us on through. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, thank Mayor. You. Thank you, Council Members. Mr. Zuniga, thanks. Good luck pulling this thank all together you. for us. Thank you. With that, let's move on to item 8.3, which is uh, another discussion uh, to review and discuss our rank choice voting ordinance. And um, Assistant City Manager Chris Wilson is going to lead us on this. Ms. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Um, give me one moment here to share my presentation. All right. This agenda item before you this evening um, relates to the implementation of ranked choice voting. Um, and I'm going to provide just a little bit of background and then ask for your direction and input as work is underway to draft an implementation ordinance. Um, as I'm sure you will all recall, but just as background for anybody watching, excuse me. Um, in November of last year, there was a ballot question posed to uh, voters in Bloomington, and that question was, should the Bloomington City Charter be amended to elect the mayor and city council members by the ranked choice voting method? And uh, the yeses did out, um, outweigh the noes on that vote, and the charter was amended. This is the new charter language as a result of that. Um, ballot question. Um, and as I won't read it all to you, but the part in yellow here says the council must adopt rules and regulations by ordinance that it considers necessary or desirable to regulate the conduct of election. Um, so that is, I guess, the key reason we are back before you tonight. The voters have made this amendment to the city charter and the city charter has delegated to you uh, the necessity of adopting an ordinance. Uh, just as a quick review to anyone who is new to the topic, um, what do we mean when we say rank choice voting? Um, it's a method that allows voters to rank their choices, just as the title suggests. Uh, first choice votes are counted off of all of the ballots. And if no candidate has a majority of the votes, then the candidate with the least number of first choice votes is eliminated. 
and voters who picked the eliminated candidate as their first choice have their vote counted for their next choice. Um, and this process is repeated until a candidate has a majority. Uh, when will it be used? Ranked choice voting in Minnesota can be used only in municipal elections. So the state allows cities to decide if they want to use charter cities, if they want to do this. Um, but when they do, it's only for mayor and city council elections. Our first use here in Bloomington will be this coming November, November of 2021, in our upcoming municipal elections. A couple of important dates to just sort of set the stage and the timeline that we're working with here. Uh, the filing period for the 2021 uh, municipal election opens July 27th. Early voting begins September 17th and election day is November 2nd. One of the key dates you'll, you might've expected to see but is missing off of this list is a date for the primary election because with the adoption of ranked choice voting, we will no longer be holding a primary during the odd numbered years for the sake of the municipal election. On the ballot this November, um, four of our, we have four council districts um, in the state, in the city of Bloomington. And um, those who live in council district one and two will see a single municipal race on their ballot. And that is for one of our at-large council seats. Those who live in council district three and four will see that same at-large council seat on the ballot as well as their district council seat. So approximately 50% of our voters will um, have the opportunity to use ranked choice voting to make one selection and the other 50% will have the opportunity to use it this November at least for two offices. Just give you an idea of how many voters we are talking about and might expect here. Here's some history on voter turnout in odd year elections. We'll be talking about them tonight as municipal elections. There are school board uh, seats um, that will be on the ballot. They will not be using ranked choice voting. As I said, it's only for the mayor and council. Uh, but this gives you some sense of the type of turnout that we might expect. At our most uh, recent municipal election, we had, excuse me, a uh, high voter turnout, um, topping 18,000. At that time, we had the mayor and council members and school board seats and a city charter question related to tap rooms on the ballot. Our project team that is working on the implementation of ranked choice voting has identified basically four uh, major components to the work that we need to get accomplished between now and the beginning of election season. One is to bring forward and have the council act on an ordinance. The second will be to develop even more detail through administrative procedures to guide how we will conduct the election and tabulate the results. We will need to train our election judges in using ranked choice voting and answering voters' questions. And then we will need to have a voter information and education component as well. Our, my primary information for you tonight and questions for you tonight relate to the ordinance, um, but I am happy to try to answer um, questions you might have about the other three. One of the reasons they are in this order is that we need the council to give policy direction on matters in the ordinance before we can, we have anything to train our judges on or before we can start sharing information with voters. There are certain questions we need the council to answer in the form of the ordinance. So, um, ranked choice voting is in Minnesota is already used in Minneapolis, St. Paul and St. Louis Park. City of Minnetonka's voters adopted ranked choice voting back in November of 2020, just like Bloomington voters did. And they are currently in the process of implementing it just as we are. They are just a couple of weeks ahead of us. Their council, I believe, had their second discussion on their ordinance um, last week, if I remember correctly. So we have seen a draft of Minnetonka's ordinance, but any information I share about that tonight would not be um, the final determination because they have not yet taken a vote on it. Um, you'll see red asterisks by four of those cities. As you know, those four cities are all in Hennepin County, like Bloomington. And when it comes to elections, that matters. In the state of Minnesota, we all work under a statewide set of laws for 
um, carrying out elections, but equipment is largely decided um, in certain other procedures, but largely equipment is decided at the county level. So Hennepin County selects the equipment we use to count ballots, um, to mark ballots if you're someone um, uh, that needs assistance marking a ballot and so forth. And so our equipment would be the same as what Minneapolis, St. Louis Park and Minnetonka are working with, whereas St. Paul being in Ramsey County, they do use different equipment than we do. So some of their choices and options may be a little bit different than ours. Uh, specifically for council discussion tonight, um, we have included a draft ordinance, just a very kind of a basic starting point drawn from those other cities that are already using ranked choice voting. We'd like to talk to you about the number of candidates that a voter may rank, um, how we are going to uh, deal with write-in candidates, and also share some information about recounts. Um, people may have questions or be wondering what the ballot will look like, um, and that is still to come. I say sort of because we don't have a whole lot of choices about what the ballot is going to look like. Due to the equipment that we use, Hennepin County has come out very strong that um, there is a ballot layout that works with our equipment. And others, while they may be attractive for certain features, just don't line up with our existing equipment the way we would need them to. So there's not actually a lot of choices to make about um, ballot layout. And then the tabulation process. Once all of the voters have cast their votes, how will we uh, go through the tabulation process to determine the, winter, the winner? And again, I can share a little bit of information about that with you tonight, um, but staff is still researching and learning on that subject um, at this point. Uh, give you an initial timeline here. We're here tonight for this initial council discussion on March 1st. There is available time on the agenda the next two Mondays, March 8th and March 15th. If you have questions tonight or we need to do additional research as staff or you just need some time to think about these issues, uh, we could put it back on the agenda for the 8th or 15th. We are planning to hold a public hearing on the draft ordinance on March 22nd. After that public hearing, the council could choose to act on the ordinance that same evening or um, give further direction to staff um, or set a date for voting on the ordinance um, after March 27th. Um, so the first question here of how many candidates to rank. Um, if you look at the ordinances of the other cities, uh, Minneapolis's ordinance says at least three. The city of St. Paul has their voters uh, may rank the number of filed candidates plus one with a maximum of six. So if they had four candidates file for office, St. Paul voters would be able to rank five of them. If they had eight candidates file for office, that cap of six would come into play and voters would only be able to rank their top six. St. Louis Parks Ordinance says at least three, but not more than six. My understanding is that the draft under discussion in Minnetonka calls for three. And they had some discussion about that um, at their council meeting last week. Um, but I believe at the moment, the current draft still calls for three. Um, in deciding how many candidates um, a Bloomington voter should be able to rank, a couple of reasons you might go with a more limited number, um, an ease of use for voters. Um, as I noted, there won't be a whole lot of races on this ballot um, in 2021, but in a couple of years after we redistrict, we will have a larger number of council seats and so forth. And, um, and maybe if we have eight candidates, it may be hard to keep those eight candidates um, in order. Um, an easier to read ballot. I'll show you a sample of what the ballot might look like here in a few slides, but um, asking voters to give us their top three choices may lead to a slightly cleaner and easier to read ballot. And it may favorably impact tabulation time. Possible reasons you, uh, someone might argue for allowing uh, more than three candidates to be ranked would be to allow for a fuller expression of voter preference. If we do have a large number of candidates who have filed, voters may have opinions and preferences that go beyond a third place choice and um, allowing them to rank more candidates more fully allows them to share those preferences. 
And you would also logically have fewer what we call exhausted ballots. Um, as we go through the rounds of tabulation and we um, eliminate the candidate, at the end of each round, we eliminate the candidate with each number of votes, uh, the lowest number of votes, excuse me. It is conceivable that if we allow voters to rank three candidates and we get to a fourth or a fifth or a sixth round of tabulation, we could have more ballots where voters, all three of their choices have been eliminated and then we have no, their ballot is what's considered exhausted. There's no other candidate to transfer their vote to. A um, couple thing, other things to keep in mind. When we set this number, voters do not have to use the full number of allowable rankings. Um, they, so for example, say we say you can vote for your top three. A voter may choose to come into the polling place cast their first choice um, vote for their first choice candidate and, and stop there. There's nothing that says that you have to fill out a second and third choice, or you could choose to fill out two and leave the third choice ranking blank. Your first two choices would be counted as long as those candidates remain in the running for that office. Um, and then just as a point of reference, uh, we looked back at recent municipal elections in Bloomington. We actually looked back about 20 years um, our deputy city clerk did. And um, we commonly see three to five candidates file for an office. Um, we do not we did not see a history of more than five candidates filing for office. So that is my sort of first chunk of information for you. And um, I would just wanted to stop here and see if people had any questions or initial feedback on this question of how many candidates a voter should rank. Council, questions of Ms. Wilson, what we heard so far. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, well, I guess just to sort of start off with, I, I guess from my perspective, um, well, let me start this way. So. You said in, in Minneapolis, the, the ordinance states at least three, it, that it allows voters to rank at least three candidates. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, based sort of on the, on the technological side, is, is, there, is there any reason we have to put a limit on the number based solely on sort of the, the technology that's available to do this tabulation? Um. Right, we're going to talk a little bit about tabulation later, just sort of a preview. As I said, staff is still researching our options for tabulation. Uh, the city of St. Paul does it differently than the city of Minneapolis and St. Louis Park. Um, and there's probably a third and a fourth way to do it as well. There's not a lot of technology right now. At least none of our Minnesota neighbors are using anything more sophisticated than an Excel spreadsheet to tabulate right now. Um, so St. Paul's process is uh, basically a hand count and Minneapolis and St. Louis Park use a um, report that comes out of the vote of the ballot machines and then um, inserts that into formulas in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, my understanding of why um, cities may have left the door open is and hope that we see improved technology and or the price come down on existing softwares that will tabulate for you. Um, and so they want to sort of allow as many rankings as is feasible. And they may be doing three right now, but hope that in two years or four years or future election cycles, as technology improves, um, that they can go to a broader ranking. Um, I guess my I would share that goal, but um, it would be my recommendation that the decision belongs firmly with the city council and the city council should set a number. And then if technology changes and there's an opportunity to do something different, staff can come back and make the council aware of that opportunity. And if the council at that time wants to change the number of rankings, we can amend the ordinance. Our ordinance amendment process is not that onerous here in the city of Bloomington that we can't do that. Um, honestly, my first read through some of those ordinances was 
oh, that's kind of vague. If the ordinance doesn't tell you exactly who many, how many candidates someone can rank, who's making that decision? I think that decision belongs in the council's hand as your acting city clerk. I would not be comfortable with that discretion being um, granted um, to the staff. I just, I think that that's a substantive policy issue for the council to decide. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I didn't mean to get too far sort of ahead of us as, as far as the, the technology, but, um, you know, I, I think part of the reason that, that you know, we put this to the voters was to sort of give them that fuller option as we, as you kind of reference. And I, I always just get a little bit wary of sort of picking arbitrary numbers. You know, does, I mean, is three too, is three not enough, but is four too many? I don't know. And that, that's, that's my concern about this is, you know, if we, you know, if we pick one number for the 2021 election, that it may work just fine, it may not, but that makes some, that if it works fine, that same number may not work well for 2023. I, what I don't want us to do is to have to come back and amend the ordinance multiple times because we're having difficulty finding the right number. So that, I guess that's sort of my preference on it is, um, you know, I, I certainly appreciate the, 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 desire to not have staff make that decision. I think that's a perfectly logical way of pursuing it. I just, I, like I said, I get a little bit wary of picking arbitrary numbers like that for a fluid situation like this. So I really didn't answer your question there, but that's where, that's where I stand. And frankly, Council Member Coulter, I'm not sure where that is. It's a... <laughs> If you, if you had to make a choice on a number, uh, I'm, I guess I'm not sure what that might be. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor. And I guess just for the, the sake of, of kind of providing feedback here, I, I appreciate that, uh, yes, three is, is probably an arbitrary number. And, and as we saw in that presentation, it kind of ranges a little bit all over the place. Uh, but I also come at this from the angle of it may be taking a couple of cycles to be able to, to really get the education out there, to get people comfortable with the system. I'm sure our communications division is going to be a terrific, do a terrific job for this coming November. Um, but I'm comfortable moving forward with three, uh, just to, to put the system out there, to be able to run through an election. Uh, and if it turns out that folks are, are really wanting just kind of a, a free for all on this and, and rank them all the way down, uh, then we'll have a little bit of experience under our belts to at least have, have started off a little bit slower uh, and known we have the logistical capacity uh, to then open things up a little bit later on. Um, certainly don't want to be going back and forth every single time, but uh, this is obviously a new system in the long history of the community and, and starting off a little bit more limited, I think makes sense to me. Others? I guess uh, Council Member Coulter again. Yeah, I'm back again. Um, just to sort of clarify, I don't, I don't have any objection to to picking a number. I just, you know, I I want to make sure that it it's flexible enough, and that to the extent that we're able, you know, we're we're getting feedback directly from voters on what their preference is, rather than oh well, I heard from some folks that three wasn't enough last time. Let's up it to six next time, and then oh six is too many. Let's so, I I guess what I'm what I'm looking for is if we, you know, that if we choose a number for, you know, to, as Council Member Martin suggests, sort of test it out, that we're able to sort of get some feedback on that and, and hear directly from voters what their preferences are, uh, rather than sort of the, the anecdotal stuff we encounter. Ms. Wilson, you mentioned that uh, some have the, the number of candidates plus one. Explain to me the mm -hmm. plus one. Why, why the plus one? Is that for write-in, to accommodate for write-in candidates? I believe so. Um, I think that that's where they get that. Um, however, there is an opportunity for a write-in at every step of the process. So you could write in as your first choice. You, your first choice vote could go to a write-in candidate. All of your choices could go to a write-in candidate. You could rank your first choice, you could write in your second, and then you could, you know, rank your third based on somebody who's, you know, filed for office and name is printed on the ballot. Um, so I, I guess I don't, I, under, I don't understand the plus one then. 
I'm not sure that I do entirely either. I'm reading their ordinance. Um, I don't necessarily have the benefit of all of the discussion that went into Minneapolis and St. Paul's decision-making processes. Both cities have been using it for over 10 years now. So um, I, like I said, I don't, I didn't follow their discussion and debate on this when they enacted it. Sure. We can do some more research and try to, you know, I can certainly reach out to St. Paul. All of the cities that currently use it have been very helpful and very willing to answer our questions and share things. I just haven't posed that specific question. Okay. And and I guess the, the point I'm making here, the, the, the direction I'm going, based on what we had talked about to try and make this uh, accessible and to give voters the choice and to have that say and who they would like to see represent them. Um, I mean, I, I in my mind, there's an argu argument to be made that if there are five people on the ballot, you can rank five people. If there are eight people, you can rank eight people. And you, granted, you run the risk of kind of a free-for-all. But at the same time, it, um, it, it gets to the goal that we had talked about to try and uh, make it more, uh, more accessible to more people and to give more people a voice in this. And um, to your point, Ms. Wilson, if, if you only want to vote for one or two or three, you don't have to vote for all eight. You certainly could limit it. But I don't know, just a... Uh, just a thought in terms of what we were trying to accomplish with this and, and how we might accomplish it uh, from a practical standpoint. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm just wondering, would there be an option to say something like at least three and up to six pending council approval so that it's just part of the process that the council kind of sets the number in the, mark, the spring before each election or something like that? So that staff isn't actually making the decision, but that the flexibility is built into the policy. Um, I hadn't considered that. I don't know if uh, Mr. Zuniga, who's been working with us on this from a legal perspective, you know, how he feels about that. Um, I do see, I guess one of the challenges I foresee is that um, we'll likely run into situations where the council members who are making those decisions in the spring of the year are on the ballot themselves running for re-election very possibly, right? Um, I, I guess it's up to the council whether or not that's a comfortable position um, that you wanna put yourself or future council members into. But Peter, I don't know if you have any thoughts on sort of the legality of that. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Carter, yeah, we would have to look very closely at that, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, especially, you know, with the goal of ordinances to help create some clarity. Uh, and so we want to try to draft the ordinances with as much clarity as possible. And so we want to be careful when we start to, to introduce element of discretion within a city ordinance. Uh, so we would uh, have to look at that and we can get back to you. Okay, I guess my understanding was that there was an element of discretion in other policies in other cities. And so, um, so yeah, I, any kind of further clarification would be super helpful on that for me. And um, I guess I do, you know, I kind of like with where the mayor was going with it too. Um, maybe it's that we say the amount of candidates on the ballot or something like that. So, and, and are you asking, for kind of general direction tonight, or we don't have to make any decisions at this point. You do not have to make any, you do not have to make any decisions. Um, I, I think it's our history here in Bloomington that what we bring forward for a public hearing, we try to make as sort of um, final as we can, but right up until the time you hold the public hearing and you take a vote, um, the council can you know amend the language of the ordinance that staff is bringing forward. So. Okay. Right. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, my assumption was the language that said at least three was because if there was only two candidates, you don't need to rank. You just vote for one of them. Um, and the up to six would be, that would be the maximum number. So if there are three candidates, there'd be three. If there are four candidates, you'd rank four. If there are five, you'd rank five. If there were six, you'd rank six, but if there were seven, you'd still only rank six. It was just a cap, but if there's less than three, you don't have to rank anything. Is that my, did I misunderstand what their policy was? The, 
What you say makes perfect logical sense to me. If we have less than three candidates, I mean, you can rank one as your first choice and one as your second choice, but that's basically going to give you the same outcome as if you had just voted for one, right? Um, so logically, yes, um, but it is my it understanding is that- St. Paul, so who knows? <laughs> I do believe that some of the older ordinances were drafted um, to go with a more modest number now in the hopes that they would expand that number as technology improved. That's that's my understanding. Um, um, the only thing uh, to throw out as well as in terms of the number is if, if I understood the history right, the most candidates we've had for a seat is five in like 20 years. Um, yes, yeah, since 1999 was we went back to the 99 election. And so, I mean, just because we haven't exhausted all of the potential options to consider, um, maybe we cap it at five because of that logic. Because I know Councilmember Coulter wants a reason to come up with the number. So, other thoughts, Council? Okay. I, I, I'll admit, Councilmember Nelson, I hadn't thought through the at least three, but no more than six logic. And that seems to be good logic. And um, I mean, I could, uh, and considering that we haven't had more than five candidates for a, a position uh, since 1999, I mean, I could certainly support that at least three, no more than six uh, provision just to uh, to move the discussion along and to to get people thinking more about what we're trying to accomplish. Mr. Mayor, I might, if that's the direction the council's interested in going, um, and I'm gonna put words in Mr. Zuniga's mouth here, I think for the sake of clarity, staff would recommend that you just say up to six. You can you know, rank up to six, um, instead of having the at least and up to, but we can continue to um, try to better understand the logic that went into the various sample ordinances we have. And and all of you have the opportunity to consider this and think on it for a few weeks as well. Um, all right, that would be helpful. Everybody okay with that? I will continue then. Pressing on. All right, the next topic that I wanted to discuss with you this evening is the topic of write-in candidates. And in the currently drafted version, which again borrows very heavily from Minneapolis and St. Louis Parks ordinances, it says that a candidate for municipal office who wants write-in votes for the candidate to be counted must file a written request with the chief election official no later than seven days before the general election. Uh, this requirement that even a write-in candidate, while somebody may not have filed for office during the official filing period in order to have their name pre-printed on the ballot, someone who wants to have votes counted for them at least needs to come in seven days in advance and fill out um, a record of that. Um, this language is in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, and St. Louis Park ordinances, and it currently appears in the draft ordinance uh, for the city of Minnetonka. Um, this language um, flows from or relates to a current state law, um, which is up on your screen now, um, which basically creates that same requirement for a candidate for county, state, or federal office. So um, write-in candidates for governor, let's say, are not counted unless um, that candidate has um, sort of registered in advance in the appropriate office for a state office. So, so this is already the law for county, state, or federal offices. Um, and it's in the ordinance for the other cities we're looking towards that already used ranked choice voting. And if it sounds familiar to you, um, that's because we've had previous discussions about it here in the city of Bloomington. Um, during 2019, the Bloomington uh, Charter Commission heard some presentation on this topic from our former city clerk. At that time, they chose not to enact it or advance it or take any further action on the proposal. 
Um, reasons brought forward at that time for having um, somebody sort of declare that they are a write-in candidate or file something seven days in advance is that without it, it's difficult to determine a candidate's identity and or eligibility for office. Um, we could have, you know, six write-in votes for John Smith, but with nothing more than that to go on, um, there's probably more than one John Smith that's a resident of the city of Bloomington. How do we know all six voters were voting for the same John Smith or which John Smith um, they were voting for? Um, the process of filing for office also allows us to make sure that the candidate who is filing is eligible. So if they're filing for a district council seat, we make sure that they reside in that district. Um, and so having some kind of advance notice that somebody wants to be a serious write-in candidate allows us to do that. And then secondly, it's just time consuming for election officials. Um, we end up counting votes for, you know, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and all kinds of, um, you know, anything somebody can, someone can write in on that line. So those are really the two reasons that were brought forward back in 2019 for considering creating this requirement here in the city of Bloomington for municipal offices. Um, staff had kind of let it go, understood that at the time the Charter Commission um, wasn't interested in sort of actively pushing it forward. And I looked back at some of the minutes of those Charter Commission meetings earlier today, and there's actually some talk about um, holding off on it until we see if and when ranked choice voting might move forward. Um, but it does take on new relevance in the context of ranked choice voting. With ranked choice voting, there are more opportunities for write-in. Voters will come across that write-in uh, field on their ballot many more times than they would have when we we're using our plurality voting system. And there's already more complexity in the tabulation of ranked choice votes. And uh, quite honestly, we just don't need to be spending our time and energy counting um, votes for made up characters or people that we don't even know how to track down or which exact person those votes are for. When I say there's more opportunity for write-in candidate, and I had promised you earlier, you would see sort of a preview of what a ballot might look like. Um, this is a sample that Hennepin County provided for us of what the ballot very well may look like come this November for our races if we went with three choices. So you'll see, you know, under our old system, when you voted for mayor, you would have had the chance to write in one write-in candidate for mayor. Um, on a ranked choice ballot, you'll have three opportunities to write in a candidate's name. And that's where my logical assumption comes from that we're going to be dealing with more write-ins. Um, and just so you can see, this is what the ballot may look like if, um, if we say, say that you can rank six candidates. It would be two rows, um, three across for six. So, I am interested in your thoughts on write-in candidates. Councilmember Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I've served uh, for a long time on the Charter Commission and uh, was part of that discussion that uh, uh, Ms. Wilson uh, mentioned. I can give a little bit of context. Um, and it's uh, my uh, recollections that uh, the overriding uh, feeling of the majority of members on the Charter Commission was is that every person who casts a vote should be counted. It was uh, a lot of different discussion, but that was uh, uh, how uh, one could summarize it in a Reader's Digest format. And uh, that is something that I personally hold very sacred. And I think we should all hold that the same. Uh, if, um, if there's a complexity involved 
in here beyond what was anticipated because of uh, the process of ranked choice voting. Uh, we should have made that aware uh, to the voting public before they made that choice. Uh, I think the technology exists to be able to handle this and it's going to take greater amounts of time in any event to do the count uh, just because there are, uh, depending upon how many there are, there's uh, three times the number of counts to possibly go through uh, for each seat if it's three or whatever the iteration is. You know, so uh, yes, it's going to be uh, more time consuming. It's going to uh, consume greater resources, but it's the sanctity of each ballot that uh, is important uh, to uh, both myself and the Charter Commission at that meeting. So. Thought I'd share that with everybody. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just really more of a process question than, than anything else, Chris. Am I correct? I'm just, I'm wondering why um, this question about write in candidates previously needed a, a charter amendment, but now can be an ordinance? Is that just by virtue of the change that happened to the charter when ranked choice voting was adopted? No, we, the city attorney and I um, spent kind of an afternoon discussing and debating and, and sort of uh, playing detective on this issue of why did we go through a charter commission process previously? Um, if you go to the Secretary of State's website, I believe it is somewhere in the state system, Melissa's nodding, Secretary of State's website, it's, and you are reading up about write-ins and so on, it says, you know, if you, basically, if you live in a charter city, you should reference your charter. And so I believe that that's maybe where this former city clerk determined that, um, you know, that the charter would need to be amended. We have confirmed, though, that these other cities who are also charter cities who use ranked choice voting, they do not have it in their charter. They have it in their ordinance, and each one of them does. That being said, in the process of researching this, we've still identified um, a cleanup in our charter that likely needs to be made, whether there's a desire to go this direction of requiring somebody to register seven days in advance or whether there isn't, because um, Melissa can explain it better, but there's some language in the charter that um, needs cleanup either way. Melissa, do you wanna chime in and save me from pretending to be a lawyer? No, sure, um, and Peter can as well. I was just working to try and pull it up, so I had it in front of me. Um, I believe it is 4.04. 4.04 of the charter, in, in, in that charter section, it says a per, all persons who desire to be elected must uh, file an affidavit with the clerk, and then it gives a time frame. Um, and so the language, um, that language, all persons that who desire to be elected, other cities have similar charter language to this, um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have this desire to be elected all persons part. Um, it simply puts forward the time frame that you have to file your affidavit of candidacy. Um, so a reading of this, a strict uh, reading of 4.04 .04 in our charter as currently drafted um, is uh, challenging to find to be consistent with uh, also requiring somebody to, to um, complete an affidavit of candidacy to be a writing candidate because we set forth one time frame in our charter and then our ordinance would say, you know, seven days before the election for write-ins. So um, our recommendation would be that we would do a little bit of cleanup on our charter so that there would be um, no inconsistencies between the, the write-in candidates and those appearing on the written ballot. Um, and we, um, it's somewhat in the, we have a couple of other charter amendments that we um, plan on bringing forward as well. And we would include that in those. Thanks, Melissa. And I think, I mean, as a non-lawyer reading that charter, you could even argue that our current charter doesn't allow for write-in candidates because it says all candidates wishing to be elected. It sort of creates this singular path to being elected. Um, but state law requires that we 
um, have some format for write-in candidates. So it, it just, it needs some cleanup. And once we have a clear idea of uh, the direction that the council wishes to go, we can initiate that process um, and in the Charter Commission as well, obviously. Uh, thank you for that. Just to sort of close the loop on this, I guess my sort of initial feeling is is uh, more aligned with with how Council Member Beloga outlined his thoughts. I I get, I mean, when when someone chooses to become a write-in candidate, they have done so for specific reasons, rather than you know filing and getting on the ballot the way other candidates have. And um, I I guess my my preference would just be. That we we count those votes and and you know allow folks that 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 full choice that that they made as far as being a write-in candidate. Other thoughts on this? All righty. All right. Well. Uh, uh, oh, Councilmember Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm comfortable with um, what uh, Councilmember uh, Beloga and Coulter said. I mean, my only question about the writing candidates was the tabulation. I don't know if now is the time to talk about that or if we'll address that later in the presentation. Um, Mr. Mayor, what is your question, Councilmember Nelson? Uh, essentially, uh, from what I read in it, uh, all writing candidates will be counted in the first tabulation. Uh, but unless they win a majority in that tabulation, they all get dropped no matter what in the second. And that, so I misunderstood that. I would need to read through the ordinance again, having taken out this concept of registering seven days in advance, because the ordinance you are reviewing that was in your packet, again, is based off of the ones that are existing in place. So it is structured around this provision that um, in order to be counted, you need to register seven days in advance. Gotcha. So and what I'm hearing from the council is you want that taken out and then the rest of the ordinance needs to be read and edited or updated with that notion in mind that we don't have that requirement. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. So it strikes me we seem to have consensus uh, with what uh, Council Member Beloga brought forward. And with that, let's uh, press forward. All righty. Um, there is a section in the draft ordinance in your packet that addresses recounts. Again, what we are starting with here is what appears in the other ordinances that are in place currently in Minnesota. Um, and in Minnesota, no recount is automatic all must be requested by a candidate. However, some are publicly funded and some are privately funded. It depends on the percentage separating the candidates. So a candidate who loses an election by less than a quarter of a percent, um, if they request that there is a recount, it is publicly funded. Um, candidates who have lost by more than that, more than that amount must put put forward a bond or some other form of surety to cover the cost of the recount. The current draft provides for a publicly funded recount um, only to the candidate eliminated in the final round, or in other words, the person that is the second place finisher when all the results are in. A privately funded recount is available to candidates eliminated in earlier rounds. Um, I put this in here specifically for discussion because I know there was a question about this um, brought to the city manager uh, between the publishing of the packet and uh, tonight's meeting. Whoops. Council, thoughts on the provisions of a recount? So from a, a process standpoint, so if how much time is there between the the end of one round of counting and the start of the next round of counting? So does a the, uh, how much time would a, a candidate who loses by one or two votes? How much time would they have to raise their hand and say nope, 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 nope? We I want to recount. 
That's actually not, Mr. Mayor, when we would do a recount. Um, recounts are conducted after the vote has been canvassed. So we would go all the way through the process. We would bring the results forward to the city council to be canvassed. And then the time frame to request a recount um, starts once the council has canvassed the vote. And then Got there's it. a certain number of days. Um, I believe it's a week, like a full seven, you know, calendar, close of business on the seventh calendar day after, I think. Um, okay, that makes more sense. Thank you. Councilmember Coulter. You folks are just getting a lot of me tonight. I have I have lots of opinions on nerdy election things. So here we go. Um, I guess I it really doesn't, frankly, it just doesn't sit well with me that only the second to last candidate or the, I should say the candidate the the second candidate in the final round of tabulation that they're the only ones who could request a recount i you know i it's obviously it's it's historically unlikely that recounts change results that i mean just even in city elections a number of votes that are cast it, it's very unlikely that recounts will result in a change um but i i think we can't ever discount that possibility for a variety of reasons. And if somebody is within that margin on, you know, the second to last or third to last or whatever it is, tabulation, um, and they get eliminated, I, I think they should have the right to request that recount, same as if they were on that last round of tabulation. I just, from a, from a process perspective, from a, a faith in government perspective, and, and knowing that you know, the person who takes office is the one who got the most votes. I That to me just seems like the best option. I know that creates more potent or potential, I should say, for more work for staff, but I just, I feel like that's just the best option. Mr. Mayor and Council Member Coulter, if I might, just to clarify, um, anybody can, re any candidate can request a recount. So there's never a candidate on the ballot who cannot request a recount. And it's and it's not about the amount of work for city staff. Um, it's who pays for it. So the issue is who is entitled to a publicly funded recount versus who has to put up a bond or a surety. A candidate who has to put up a bond or a surety to have us do a recount, if the vote actually swings and changes the outcome, then they do not actually have to pay that you know whatever they put up for it is returned to the candidate and the city would be responsible for the cost of having done that um but yeah just to be clear everybody's entitled to a recount the question is um are we going to make that available at the taxpayer's expense or at the candidate's um at least initial expense and thank you for that that clarification i was i was imprecise with my language i apologize for that i I think a, a I think the the public recount should apply to every round of tabulation. The publicly funded recount should apply to every round of tabulation, same as it would the last round. Other thoughts? Councilmember Beloga, you got your hand up. Is that an old hand or is that a, a new hand? Old hand, sorry. Not a problem. Additional thoughts on recounts? Just in general, what is the cost of a recount? What, um, if, if we were, if we were to do this, if we were to make it publicly funded, uh, if every, you know, if you're within a one quarter of 1%, what is the cost of a recount? Do we have any idea as it relates to rank choice voting? Uh, yes. Um... One moment, we had a request for a recount following the November 2020 election, and it did not qualify for a publicly funded recount. And so to recount that, we had told the petitioner that they would need to put up $12,259. Please keep in mind though, that was to recount every ballot in a presidential election, and we had over 50,000 ballots cast in Bloomington um, this past November. So that definite, and we would have hand recounted all 50,000. 
Um, so the cost is going to depend on the number of ballots that have to be touched because that determines how many staff we need and how many days worth of work we have to pay them for. I would expect that recounting a municipal race, unless we see a fabulous um, growth in turnout, which hopefully we do, but with the numbers I showed you earlier, the recount um, you know, would likely be less than half of that for a municipal race because we've historically see less than half that many voters. Councilmember Lohman. So I just wanted to get clarity on what Councilmember Coulter was saying. Is, are, are you saying, Councilmember Coulter, that if you're falling in within that that half of a percentage, it doesn't matter what round you fall in, there'd be public funding, or does it not matter to you at all what that percentage is? You should be entitled to. I'm just trying to get be clear about what what you're saying, Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, and and I think that's important. I get. I think the actual percentage that that Chris referenced was one quarter of 1%. Um, but I, I would say, you know, that regardless of the round in which uh, a candidate is eliminated, if they are within one quarter of 1% of, I guess it would be the, the next closest candidate who is not eliminated, uh, that that person could then uh, request a recount that would be publicly funded. So if say, in a certain round, one can the next candidate to be eliminated gets 8.8%, and the candidate, the next candidate to them who did not get eliminated got 9%. That 8.8% candidate could request that recount at public expense. Makes more sense, Councilor yeah, Malone. Yeah, thanks for that clarity. Yeah, because I, I, I thought you were saying something completely different. Thanks for saying that. That makes a lot more sense. So I, I thought the other thing you said did make a lot of sense. That makes a lot more sense now. Thanks. So with those two comments together, I'd actually bring up a question, and I'm assuming Councilmember Coulter, I, I, I won't assume anything, Councilmember Coulter, but if we're, if we're to accounting where, even if it's the first round where, you know, the top four move on and somebody finishes sixth and challenge, you know, finishes one quarter of 1% out of finishing fifth, I would hope we're not paying for that recount because if, if it's not affecting who moves on, I would, I would hope we're not, you know, if, if it's just a matter of positioning as opposed to who moves on in the counting. Is that, am I being clear? Obviously not, because I got a lot of blank stares looking at me on the screen right now. Uh, if it's a matter of positioning as opposed to moving on in the count, um, I would hope we we would draw the line there in terms of whether or not it's a publicly funded recount. Mr. Mayor, if I might, I mean, I, our legal department can certainly craft it that way. And I would also say that generally speaking, we're going to be eliminating one candidate per round, not like two or three candidates per round. So uh, I clear that up. That, that, that makes more sense than that clears that up. Thank you. I think it's unlikely we'd run into that. Okay. Okay. Shall I Please, continue? Under. I think I've just got a couple of um, slides left. Um, like I said, I am not seeking council direction on tabulation methods at this point. Um, in fact, um, I will be back and we will talk more about this. Most cities have their tabulation method left to their administrative rules and they do not spell it out um, in their ordinance. But the tabulation methods that we have uncovered in our research. Um, the first is used, um, the city of Ramsey County conducts elections on behalf of the city of St. Paul. So if I mistakenly say Ramsey County, it's for a St. Paul municipal election. They do a hand count of ballots and they physically take the ballots that the voter marked. Um, and if nobody wins um, 50, percent plus one vote as tabulated by the machine of first choice votes, they start sorting and stacking and counting the ballots. Um, the cities of Minneapolis and St. Louis Park get a report out of our ballot machines called a cast vote record, which has the same three letters in its acronym as ranked choice voting. So I try and say that really carefully. They get a CVR which is a cast vote record. 
and they use that combined with some sophisticated Excel spreadsheets that have formulas in them um, to determine the um, tabulation. And then there is tabulation software on the market. Um, the city of Ramsey County is currently contemplating um, a purchase of that and looking at that. And um, it is very expensive and not in our budget, at least for this year. Um, and so, um, and I'm not even entirely sure sort of what it does. Um, there is a national ranked choice voting organization that makes available sort of some um, open source software. And um, we are gonna be seeing a demo of that. Um, it's on our calendars. I can't remember if it's next week or the following week along with the city of Minneapolis and St. Louis Park. So Minneapolis set that up and invited us to come along uh, digitally and check it out. So we'll be doing that. And as I said, continuing to research um, and better understand the options available to us for tabulation. As we do that, some of the things that we as staff are taking into consideration, obviously first and foremost is the accuracy of the system. Whatever we do, we want something that has the lowest possible risk of even the slightest error. Secondly um, is transparency. And what is the public's ability to follow along and understand the way that we tabulate votes? Um, timeliness, how long using the various methods that are available, how long will it take us to get to final results in an election? And then obviously cost. Uh, the cost of possibly purchasing some kind of tabulation software versus the cost of staff time for doing it in any kind of more manual um, method. So those are really some of the considerations that we are taking into place or into consideration. Um, I do want to share sort of a first impression, and that is, I think in the year 2021, the idea that we would hand tabulate anything seems maybe a little bit uh, silly or ridiculous to some possibly. Um, but it's actually um, scores pretty high on the transparency. We've seen video and a demonstration of how St. Paul um, tabulates their votes and how they count them and stack them and assign them to different candidates. And um, our staff's initial impression of that is it's very easy to follow along. The average person can watch them do that and understand how they do it and how they get to the results. It's logical, it's easy to understand. Um, whereas the process of taking a cast vote record report out of the software and then putting it into a complex or sophisticated Excel spreadsheet is a little bit like, well, we take this report and it's almost like we put it into this black box and out spits the result. Um, in my first review of it, it, while I'm not questioning its accuracy, I struggle with the transparency of it a little bit. And can I explain to our Bloomington voters exactly how it works and build the kind of faith and trust we want them to have in the outcome of our elections? So those are things that we're weighing, like I said, researching more, still digging into it, still looking for a third, fourth, or possibly fifth way of doing this. Um, but we're gonna have to make a decision here um, relatively shortly, meaning in the next few months of which way we are gonna go so that we are ready for the election this year. And then my last couple of slides are just a preview of something we will definitely talk more about, and that is voter outreach and engagement. Um, we will, I think it almost goes without saying nowadays that we'll be using the city website and social media um, we will be using our engagement platform of Let's Talk Bloomington. We already have a page that published, I believe, today on Let's Talk Bloomington about ranked choice voting. And we have a little survey out there about how many candidates voters want to rank. So the next time we talk about this, um, I will be able to share some of that, um, admittedly unscientific, but, but local feedback with you. We'll be using the Bloomington briefing, creating some videos um, and considering some direct mailings as well. A couple of key considerations will be to make sure that our efforts reach voters through multiple formats. We all know that we have a certain segment of our population that gets their information almost solely in a, some type of digital or internet based format. 
And we also have voters who either do not have access to or just don't feel comfortable or choose not to use the internet. And we have an obligation to reach those folks as well. And then we'll also be paying particular attention to how we reach voters for whom English is a second language. Um, as we move from simply marking a circle on the ballot to more complex instructions for voters, we want to make sure that those are understood by all of our voters. Um, and our voter outreach and engagement um, will also, we hope to include community events. We hope to be able to have a a face-to-face -face presence with residents and voters, um, but that's obviously going to depend on the pandemic and whether some of those summer events that are typically held in Bloomington each year, um, whether they get to be held this year. Will we have heritage days? Um, we, I fully expect we will have farmer's markets in some points. Um, will we have summer fest? Those places where we can be available for direct questions from voters and talk to them about this. And then we'll be holding mock elections as well, um, plural. State law requires that we hold one between September 23rd and November 1st. And so we will certainly meet our obligation under state law. Um, however, if you remember my timeline um, from my second or third slide, early voting opens on September 17th. So we won't be waiting until September 23rd to hold our first mock election. We will be looking for opportunities to do that earlier than that. Um, and that's that's great. It's intended our primary audience there is our voters so that when they come in to cast their ballot, either on election day, absentee from their kitchen table or um, through early voting, that they feel confident that they can use that ballot to convey their choices and preferences to us. Um, but the mock election is us, honestly for our staff as well. Um, we want practice in tabulating um, this vote before we actually get to election day. So the mock election will serve that dual purpose of being information and education for voters, as well as um, training for our staff and election judges. So that is what I have for you this evening. Um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions folks might be wondering about ranked choice voting or how this is going to work. And we do have you coming back, as I recall, in the next couple of weeks as well. Well, I guess that's up for, I need some sort of direction for the council. Um, we, I heard a desire to, um, from one council member to allow, provide for a publicly funded recount for any elimination that falls in that threshold of being close, right? Um, but I, I think I only heard one council member's opinion on that. So do other council members have an opinion they want to share with staff and some direction for tonight? Do you want to think about it and come back and give staff direction either on the 8th or the 15th? Um, we heard more voices on the write-in candidate issue. I think I heard at least four people on that one say that they did not want somebody to have to register seven days in advance to have write-in votes counted. So we'll proceed to remove that from the draft and any sort of hangers on or you know sentences that are related to that. Um, and if I could, Chris, why don't we plan on you next week as well? Okay. Uh, maybe even to talk tabulation. I'm looking at the clock right now. I'm make, trying to make sure we get through the rest of our agenda this evening. Certainly. So, so if we look at uh, having you back next week to to answer fully the rest of those questions, including the discussion on tabulation, which uh, I don't know how much input you want from us, but uh, maybe people can ponder it a little bit and noodle it and come back uh, with, ready for discussion next week. Yeah, I'd love your thoughts and questions. I don't know that we're going to be ready on fully on tabulation next week, but we can certainly have a discussion and, and talk more about it. But I don't know that our research on that subject um, will be done by next week. Sounds good. Well, whatever, whatever you can bring forward, I think would be helpful. Certainly. Council Member Beloga, a quick question? Uh, well, not a quick question, but a comment. Yes. Uh, I, I think that the uh, uh, priorities that uh, uh, Ms. Wilson laid out uh, certainly coincide with mine in that uh, accuracy is paramount and transparency. Uh, to have a Excel spreadsheet, uh, you know, I, I just... That that just uh, 
I can't I can't put it to words what uh, what I'm trying to say, especially in a public forum. Uh, but uh, you know, it's it's voodoo mathematics uh, is the potential there. So um, you're you're on the right track. I would agree with you, Council Member. And but uh, as I said, if we could wrap up the rest of these items next week in a in a short uh, uh, a short item and. Um, Whatever you could bring back in terms of tabulation, we could have that discussion then, and we can move forward with this. Certainly. All right. All righty. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you. Let me bring you your next presenter. Next on our agenda is item 8.4, which is a discussion on our 2022 budget process and timeline. Feels like we just got done with the budget Kari I, I don't know what right? so, so. you let Miss Carlson left us alone for two months and now she's back again so here we go good evening thanks for sticking it out with us so far welcome uh thank you very much uh good evening mayor and council so I am here tonight to discuss um the approach the plan for the 2022 budget process I'm just going to share this slide with you that I shared with you at the truth and taxation hearing on December 7th. And if you recall, this is the 2022 conceptual property tax levy, and we are showing a 0% increase in the total tax dollars. And, um, you know, there are variables that can affect this, such as revenue forecasting for lodging and emission taxes. But um, at this time, it still looks reasonable to forecast a budget that would have no change or minimal change to the 2021 tax levy. But as if you um, if you recall from discussions last year from the city assessor, Matt Gershmill, uh, the market value adjustments that will affect 2022 property tax statements are showing a 7.3% increase in value to the median value home. So the median value home is increasing from around $286,000 to $307,000. And so that gain to residential property, along with uh, losses in value and commercial properties, will result in a tax based shift uh, for the 2022 tax uh, levy. So it's going to place a greater tax burden on single family homeowners, if you recall. So you can see on the right of the slide that a 0% tax levy increase for the overall tax levy. Um, equates to an eight and a half percent increase to taxes uh, for the median value home. And that would be seven dollars and seventy four cents a month, or almost ninety three dollars a year. Um, just a quick recap: um, This is what we're going to be working on. Uh, there's thirty operating fund budgets. There's, of course, the general fund. Um, that's the the big one um, that has, you know, all of the. Uh, that handles the majority of the city operations like public works and police and fire, parks and recreation, et cetera. Um, in 2021, that was a budget of almost $80 million and it's supported by around $57 million in property taxes. Um, we also have our 12 special revenue funds. Um, the majority of those do not receive property taxes, um, but communications, the communications fund and the fire pension fund, they do. Um, there's the nine enterprise funds and the four recreation facility funds, the aquatics, golf, ice garden, um, art center, they do receive property tax support. Um, so does the solid waste fund um, just for the removal of diseased trees or forest tree, where the other um, enterprise funds, the other utility funds, and the police contractual overtime fund. And then um, rounding it up is the eight internal service funds and uh, they all indirectly receive property tax um, since their uh, revenues are internal and they come from other funds. But, um, and just also we'll note there are many other funds in the city. Uh, we have debt service funds and capital funds, but those are not included in this annual budget process. Um, those bond sales for debt service come to the um, council separately for approval. And of course the annual capital improvement plan which is a plan of capital projects is brought to council and then those individual capital projects get approved individually, those capital funds. Just wanna talk about uh, community budget advisory committee uh, that we had for the first time. Uh, last year's budget process was very different 
it had a very robust um, engagement incorporated into the process. Um, sorry about that. Um, and the Community Budget Advisory Committee um, was, of course, appointed by the council last year and successfully addressed the large 2021 budget shortfall that we were facing. And the committee's many hours of 17 publicly held meetings from June through October, um, and then also their community engagement listening sessions helped to prioritize tough budget reduction options that were presented to the council, those three different budget scenarios. However, um, for the 2022 process, uh, we don't recommend creating a community budget advisory committee for this uh, process. And the reason for that is um, last year, that budget committee was brought together to help address a specific budget crisis due to the pandemic. And we don't feel it's necessary to continue on that with the committee for 2022. Based on those budget decisions that were made in 2020, the conceptual tax levy for 2022 is already at a 0% increase for the 2021 levy, or, or sorry, 2022 levy. Um, there are also concerns of the timing restraints on what it would take to and appoint and provide backroom and background education to a brand new committee. However, um, taking it, we want to take into account those lessons learned from last year and the positive feedback that we received during the budget process. Um, and we're recommending um, these following actions in lieu of a formal resident advisory group. So we want to continue with opportunities for community engagement and resident feedback by hosting community listening sessions. Hopefully we can have an opportunity to do some of that in person this year, later in the year. But either way, we would still have that video conference option as well, as there were many people who prefer to engage in, in this format, um, video conferencing, rather than coming into an in-person meeting. So we at least um, have that, but um, hopefully also in person. And we'll continue to use our you know, new Let's Talk Bloomington digital engagement platform that was launched last year um, to obtain feedback about the budget and decisions that are being discussed. And we will focus on transparency and education of the budget process and city finances, as we did receive a lot of positive feedback about the level of detail that was shared last year. Um, residents really appreciated that. And we will provide clear budget options to you, to the council and decision points, as well as share that uh, public feedback that we get with you. And we are planning to take the same approach as we did um, when we had the budget committee, but just now do it directly with the council and um, organizing it by first analyzing the options we have for different revenue forecasts, like what we're expecting for lodging and emission taxes and permanent revenue, and then structuring tax levy options and corresponding budget expenditure options with that for you to decide on. So I'm just going to quickly uh, run through just the months of the year and highlight some of the budget activities. And I have um, highlighted in blue items that will involve the city council or a community engagement um, event. So in March, uh, right now, like this week, we're going to be publishing last year's uh, budget book. So that'll be out on the website and we'll be submitting that to the Government, Government Finance Officers Association for their Distinguished Budget Board. And uh, property owners will be um, receiving their 2022 property value notices soon. And that is what is going to be used for their 2022 property tax calculation. Uh, we're start, going to be starting work on 2022 salary and benefit projections and start working on those 2022, um, tweaking those internal service fund charges. In April and May, um, we would like to finance and assessing, would like to do some education on property valuations and how it affects property tax. Um, we think a, a public education initiative would be helpful. Um, that is confusing about how um, your property valuations and then the shift between residential and commercial can really affect your property taxes um, along with the tax levy. And then have a meeting in April with the council on uh, revenue analysis and a direction on tax levy options. Um, in May, internally, we'll be doing a kickoff on May 27th for, um, for employees and departments to start entering those requests in our financial software. And then uh, June and July, departments are going to be working with their finance staff that they're assigned to and um, analyzing expenses, talking about future needs, what they're going to be doing, their services. And then um, after that, meeting with the city manager, assistant city manager, CFO, and myself, and talking through those budget requests and pulling it all together to see what it looks like. 
And then you'll see there's going to be more blue on the slide. So in August, um, we'd like to have some budget community engagement and education events. Um, as I said, hopefully some in person, but definitely virtual as well. We'll have things out on Let's Talk Bloomington for the budget. Um, we will have department. Uh, we'd like to have the departments when they're coming to the council meetings and presenting their budget requests, like really highlighting what's changing in their budget requests and highlighting challenges and um, successes in their departments. And then September is when the preliminary tax levy is due to Hennepin County uh, for 2022 tax levy. We'll have some updated Let's Talk Bloomington questions. And then um, in October, we should be able to bring some of those special revenue budgets to council for approval that don't require count, um, that don't require property tax. In November, that's when the truth and taxation flyers that we uh, put together will arrive in property um, owners mailboxes. And um, that is again, where it's another time we're gonna be um, doing some education on property valuations and how they affect property taxes. In uh, November, November 15th, we'll be doing the uh, utility rate public hearing and utility fund budgets, looking at internal service budgets to bring those to council. And then uh, really finalizing with council where you wanna land for your uh, final property tax levy for 2022 and the final budgets that have property tax. And that'll bring us to December. Um, Truth and Taxation public hearing will be December 6th. The final tax levy is due to Hennepin County at the end of December. And then we'll start working on the 2022 budget book to start over again. Um, and that's what I have for tonight. Are there any questions, comments, or suggestions? A rapid fire trip through the budget year. <laughs> I was trying to go fast. Council, any questions or comments on this? Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. So um, we've talked about um, creating some type of tax stabilization fund, and I'm just curious, when would that come into play in this process, in those discussions? I think we could start, um, I'm sorry, Mayor and Council Member Carter, I think we can start talking about that in April when we come to talk about um, the revenue analysis and looking at that and how that would affect um, different tax levy options. Okay, Thank awesome. Question. Thank you. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I, I certainly appreciate why staff recommended uh, not having another community budget advisory committee and I'm I'm you know I'm willing to move forward with that um I do think that's something we should consider in future years I just I think there is a lot of utility in you know in in having a committee of members of the community to to make those decisions and evaluate those decisions I I think there is just a lot of utility there um that being said since that is not going to be the case this year um I just want to encourage staff to find ways you know even beyond the sort of the the um the electronic tools and so on that we have or direct interaction with with decision makers with staff and with council members i mean i i think that's what a lot of this boils down to is is folks just wanting to sort of have that interaction and ask their questions and and feel like they understand things in a more sort of fundamental way um, so I, I think to the extent that that's possible this year, that's that's something we should definitely be doing. Thank you, Councilmember Coulter. And, and I agree with you completely, Councilmember Coulter, regarding the Community Budget Advisory Committee. I think they were very, that, that group was very effective and we got some great information out of them and uh, they did a wonderful job. One thing that, uh, I, just kicking around without any details on it, um, that I would like to consider in the future, I can get it, I get it this year with a 0% levy increase proposed I don't see the, there wouldn't be as much utility, but what I would like to think about in years in the future, perhaps um, reconstituting a community budget advisory committee, but rather than taking on the entire budget to maybe parse out the budget into four chunks, four, four different pieces, four different departmental budgets and, or, or four different groupings. And so once every four years, the community budget advisory committee would look at a specific portion of the budget and make recommendations on it. And then the next year, the, the next group, three and four, and then back to the first group again. 
and I, I think we could we could structure this in such a way that it could be useful. It could be a way to to do basically what the community budget advisory committee did this past year, uh, but on a more incremental basis and a more manageable basis. I mean, that 17 meeting schedule was was a monster for the uh, budget advisory committee, and I'm hearing that from members of the committee that they thought it was useful, but it was a, it was a challenge and it was a it was demanding. So if we broke it down in that way, I think it might be more uh, more uh, manageable for the committee members and for staff. And I mean, we could possibly also time this in such a way that the uh, if we're on a four-year rotation or four-year cycle, that perhaps it's it coordinates with the uh, the departmental reviews that we have planned for the different departments and the different budgets. And so they kind of go hand in hand. I, there, there's different ways that we could take a look at this and different ways to do it. But I do think I. I would hate to uh, completely abandon the budget advisory committee model because I agree it was it was very helpful and very useful. Council, anything to add on this? Any other questions, comments, concerns? I am not seeing any hands up. So, Ms. Carlson, thank you so very much. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to getting back into it. Me too. With that, we'll move on to item 8.5, which is uh, review and approval of our citywide organics recycling program scope of services. And I think we have with us this evening, I know we've got uh, uh, Laura Horner, from, who's our public works project manager. I think I see her coming online, I believe. And uh, Tim Sandry from our um, sustainability commission. And uh, Ellen Bialis, from, uh, who's our Public Works Project Coordinator as well. All right, excuse me, thank you. Um, so who's kicking this off? Uh, I think that would be me. Mr. Good Sandy, evening, good Mayor. evening, welcome. Thank you, thank you. It's good to, good to be back. I missed you guys. Um, so good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Tim Sandry, and I am the uh, Chair of the Bloomington Sustainability Commission. I'm here tonight with uh, Public Works uh, Project Coordinator Laura Horner and Deputy Director uh, Ellen Bialis. Uh, we are here tonight because the uh, 2021 Sustainability Commission Work Plan that was recently approved by uh, the Council includes an initiative to develop a plan in 2021 that would enable rolling out a residential curbside organics recycling program in 2022. Uh, so the commission tonight is looking for your approval of a proposed scope of services as the first major step in making residential curbside organics recycling a reality in Bloomington. Uh, what you'll see tonight are uh, recommendations for a scope of services that, have, that were developed by a joint solid waste working group made up of city council and sustainability commission members. This proposed scope of services will provide the framework that will ensure curbside organic recycling in this, uh, uh, will enable uh, curbside organic recycling in the city of Bloomington. So our goal tonight is for the council to review and approve the scope of services for a residential curbside organics collection program to be implemented in 2021. Uh, next slide, please. The drivers behind this initiative are as follows. In 2014, the Minnesota State Legislature uh, set a goal for metro counties to recycle or compost 75% of solid waste by 2030. Despite that, residential waste sorts, waste sorts find organic material continues to be the largest proportion of our trash, making up fully a third of the trash stream. So in an, and in an effort to divert more organics from the waste stream, Hennepin County passed a revised Ordinance 13, which now requires cities with more than 10,000 residents to make curbside organics recycling services available to all households by 
January 1st, 2022, which is in about 10 months. Having said that, Bloomington is well positioned to move forward with curbside organics collection because uh, of some of the fine work that was done on the city's solid waste services contract, which allows uh, curbside organics collection to be made available to residents. It also allows the city operation, uh, the city the option to consider various uh, organics collection methods. Uh, and once a method is selected to negotiate a rate with the consortium, and lastly, if the city and the consortium cannot come to an agreement on a rate after good faith negotiations, the city has the right to contract with another service provider to supply the program. And just as background, uh, we currently have uh, approximately 22,000 households in the city garbage and recycling program. The annual budget for those services is uh, approximately uh, 6.4 million. And the estimated cost of the proposed organic services that we're talking about tonight is uh, 1.6 uh, million. Next slide, please. This is a very quick overview of our efforts today to remove organics from the trash stream. One of the first initiatives of the newly formed Sustainability Commission in 2017 was to establish an organics drop-off program. That program was kicked off in 2018. The intention of the organics drop-off program was twofold. First was to give residents the opportunity to divert organics, and secondly, to build a base of support and some champions for organics recycling that would better enable us to transition to curbside organics collection. As you can see from the graph, the number of residents using the drop-off program has tripled since its rollout, and we currently have approximately 1,700 registered residents, which is a little over 6% uh, of the residential solid waste customers. And so we already have a good base of supporters and champions of organic collection. Each dot on this uh, animated map on the right shows household signups for the organics drop off over time. As you can see, there is fairly even citywide use and not it's not necessarily clustered to one part of uh, Bloomington or another. Uh, next slide, please. So to um, uh, one of the reasons why we've been successful is that we've had a number of in, uh, public engagement efforts. Uh, so in order to make residents aware of the program and promote its growth, we have conducted ongoing engagement surrounding organics recycling since, since its inception, including creating a virtual organics 101 workshop in uh, 2020 that uh, shows the basics of organics that has been well received and is linked uh, to our website, uh, and also engaging residents on uh, organics at all of our, all, uh, for the Sustainability Commission, all of our tabling events and handing out countertop uh, organic bins. Uh, the commission and staff surveyed residents about the current program and their interest uh, in moving to, uh, uh, to curbside organics collection. Uh, we received uh, close to 1,500 responses, which were almost evenly split between people who currently use the drop-off program and those who do not. And one of the most interesting results is that 61% of, of the respondents said that they were somewhat likely to very likely participate in curbside organics recycling at a cost of around $6 a month. In addition, we received uh, over 190 open-ended comments requesting that the city add curbside organics collection. So these response, responses seem to indicate that there is a significant uh, support for a citywide program. 
So now I'm going to turn, I'm going to pass the baton to Public Works Project Coordinator Laura Horner, who has done most, has done the bulk of the staff work on this effort to date. She will review the uh, proposed scope of uh, uh, services and address any specific questions or concern you might have. Uh, following that, we'd like to obtain your approval on the proposed scope of services so that staff can begin uh, negotiations with the haulers on a price and bring forward a recommended scope of service proposal to the uh, council for approval. So good evening, mayor and council members. My name is Laura Horner, the public works project coordinator. Thank you, Chair Sandry, for providing more background regarding curbside organics recycling and our public engagement efforts to date. So regarding our schedule and process for making curbside organics recycling available, in order to meet that Hennepin County requirement to have a program in place by January 1st of 2022, the haulers have indicated that they would need six months to prepare and purchase additional trucks and other equipment. So with that understanding, the city would need to have a service agreement in place by July of this year. Over the past two months, we have met with the Joint Solid Waste Working Group of City Council and the Sustainability Commission to develop a recommendation for how organics recycling should be made available to residents. The Working Group's recommendation has been incorporated into a draft scope of service that we are seeking Council approval on this evening. And once that scope of service is approved by Council, staff will negotiate a price and draft service agreement with the consortium and then would return to council with a recommended service for uh, a service proposal for council's approval. So during our joint solid waste working group meetings, the group considered four key program areas to be incorporated into a scope of service. Staff provided advantages and disadvantages of each potential option and provided available information from other cities with organics recycling programs to use as reference points during those discussions. The group then made a formal rec recommendation related to each of these decisions that we will share tonight in further detail for your approval. So the first key program decision relates to how the city intends to meet that Hennepin County ordinance requirement to make organics recycling service available. The city can meet this by, by contracting for, a, for the service citywide, or instead by requiring that haulers offer the service through their annual city hauling license. So after the working group discussed the advantages and disadvantages of both potential options, the solid waste working group's recommendation was to move forward with a contract for citywide service. The next key decision point is related to the method of collection. There are three ways, three different ways that organics have been collected in residential programs. And two of the three methods as shown on this slide are not available to us. Co-collection of organics and garbage, also known as a strong bag method in our contract, and co-collection with yard waste. Our contract with the consortium includes a price for that strong bag organics collection program, but currently it is not feasible as the capacity to process and sort that material is still not available today. Our contract, as Commissioner Sandry did mention, allows us options, allows us the opportunity to consider alternative methods of collection. So with the understanding of what methods we could use realistically to meet that county requirement, the solid waste working group ultimately recommended to move forward with collection of organics in a separate part. The next key program decision relates to how organics should be paid for. Should all solid waste customers pay for the service, like regular recycling operates, or should only those who want to use the service pay? This would be a subscription service like our yard waste program operates. We shared a table with the solid waste working group that summarizes how other metro communities have provided organics recycling. And as you can see, cities where everyone pays for the service have participation rates ranging from 35% to 49%.
while cities who offer the program through subscription have participation rates ranging from 3% to 8%. The cost per month varies significantly in these two program models. The cost in a subscription model is much higher, which leads to lower use by residents and, and less environmental benefits. So after reviewing the advantages and disadvantages of both of these options, the solid waste working group's recommendation was to move forward with an all pay model. The last major decision we discussed with the solid waste working group was whether when the program is rolled out, if carts should be delivered to all residents at one time, or if carts should only be delivered to residents that sign up for the service. We reviewed how other cities have rolled out carts and the advantages and disadvantages of each option. And ultimately the solid waste working group recommended that carts be delivered to all residents with an opt out process prior to the rollout. Uh, the city would develop a robust communication and education plan that provides residents with an opportunity to opt out ahead of time if they do not want a cart. Our education would also include details related to cost savings of downsizing your garbage cart by participating in organics and the benefits of organics overall. And because this will be a new concept for many, we intend and realize that we will need to do significant education prior to any rollout. So the scope of services includes the solid waste working groups recommendations for those key decision points that we reviewed this evening, as well as other operational requirements for providing the service. And again, we are seeking approval from Council this evening to approve a scope of service, a scope of services. So at this time, um, Commissioner Sandry and I will be joined by Deputy Director Bialis to take any questions before you consider approving the scope of services. Thank you very much for the presentation. Council, questions or comments on this? And uh, I do want to say, remembering that um, I think we talked about this as a council back in December, I think it was, uh, before the turn of the year, we talked about how we wanted to approach this. And, and uh, I believe the council set forth the, the direction that they wanted the Solid Waste Working Group to, to make these decisions and, bring, and, and go forward with it. And that's, that's what we did. And, uh, but I, I will say that uh, in the spirit of wanting to make sure that we were on the right track and, and got everybody in agreement, because this is this is not a big or this is not a small deal. This is a, this is a big deal that we wanted to bring this back one more time for the the council to to discuss and to look at and to chew on a little bit. And uh, so there's there, there's a lot there. There was a lot of discussion. There was a lot of, of um, back and forth that went into the decisions and into the recommendations that came out of the solid waste working group. I do think it was a good collaborative approach. I will tell you, not everybody agreed on everything, but we came up with a, a, a consensus on everything that we are bringing forward tonight. And uh, frankly, I think it's, it sets us up well for success as we move forward into organics collection in the city of Bloomington. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have two quick things. Uh, one is actually um, not completely related to the recommendation, but just a process question. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Sandry or Chair Sandry had indicated that if we weren't able to successfully negotiate with the uh, consortium that we could um, work with other people. And I guess my question is, is this something we can put out for RFP at this time? So the way that our um, mayor and council member, council member Nelson, the way that our contract is written we would first need to negotiate in good faith with the consortium on, uh, on a scope of services. And at that time, if we did not come to agreement with the consortium, we would have the opportunity to go out for RFP. Great, um, thank you. And then um, the only other comment I had, and I think this was addressed in questions I had sent in earlier, I appreciate the answers on those, was just um, making sure people understand that they can save uh, uh potentially a significant portion of the cost of this organics by downsizing the size of their regular trash can um if they have a medium or larger size and just providing a proactive way of doing that um and in general i i um, appreciated the opt-out approach 
uh, for getting cans carts out to everybody and allowing people that uh, just really didn't want to do it to opt out of the program if they wanted to, um, at least opt out of the getting the cart portion of it. Mayor and Council Member Nelson, you, you are correct that there's about a $4 difference between each garbage cart size. So if a resident were to move from a large cart to a medium cart, uh, they could almost cover the cost of adding the organics recycling service. And we would make sure that any education that we provide regarding this does, does speak to the cost savings that a resident could achieve. And I will say, Council Member Nelson, I, I uh, tip my hat to Council Member Lohman for pushing that very hard in the solid waste working group that he wanted to make sure that there was that that balance between uh, being able to reduce the size of your cart, your your trash cart, uh, with the the size of the or with the uh, the organics cart that's going to be taking a, a good portion, up to a third, as as Chair Sandry said, up to a third of your your trash into a different cart. So, uh, well done by Council Member Lohman to to make sure that we stuck to that and followed that as closely as we could. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, and, and I appreciate the, um, the uh, work of the Solid Waste Working Group and, and the staff presentation. I think uh, my, my questions just revolve around um, rolling out this um, kind of citywide for everybody on such a truncated timeline. Um, so I, as, as provided um, in the documentation tonight, there's kind of a timeline um, it looks like in July, the haulers are going to be ordering all these carts. Uh, and that's at the same time as we're starting largely our public communication around this. Um, so I guess, it, am I correct in assuming the haulers are probably going to order carts for everybody? And then we're going to find out how many people will opt out. Um, uh, oh, oh, go ahead, Laura. Go ahead, Ellen. <laughs> um, Mayor, uh, Council Member Martin. Um, yes, the haulers likely will have to order their carts ahead of time just because there's a significant lead time on needing to, to order those so that they can be manufactured in time. Um, given the haulers' experience in this area and given what we've seen in other communities, there may be some ways for us to estimate what we might see in terms of dropout but likely they are going to need to order a significant number of carts to do the method where we roll out to everybody. Okay, and, and do we have a, a ballpark idea? I had seen Edina um, in similar communities were projecting about 35% of residents were um, putting these carts out. Do we have an idea if they were to go back in time and provide that opt-out data ahead of time, what they might've told the haulers? Um, uh, Mayor Council Member Martin, um, uh, Edina rolled out carts to all of their residents all at once. And from their experience, they told us that about 20% of their residents um, really wanted the carts picked up right away. Um, so they they had a pretty significant drop off, um, you know, almost right out of the gate. Um, but uh, now that their residents have the carts out there, they do say that about 50% of the folks who have the carts are using them. And they're optimistic that as people kind of learn more about the program, because they have the carts, that they will begin using them in greater numbers. Their program is still relatively new. And that's typically what programs that have been a little bit established over time tend to see a pickup in participation. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and just briefly, uh, kind of one more there. I, I'd seen also um, just in terms of making sure that the stream of organics uh, is up to collection standards, we were going to be asking uh, the folks picking it up to jump out and visually inspect um, that there isn't non-organic material in those. I guess with, again, with that truncated education timeline, and maybe it's not truncated, I guess I'd appreciate your perspective on that as well. Uh, do we feel like we're going to see more error rates potentially? Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering the cost of that visual inspection, if that's going to mess with our $6 per cart estimate that we have here. Um, Mayor Council Member Martin, I think uh, we're asking the haulers to provide that visual inspection because we do think it's very important. There's a pretty significant cost on the back end if we deliver contaminated materials to the processing site. Um, we've looked at programs in cities around us, and the haulers have been willing to agree to that in other locations. 
um, for kind of the price point that we've been looking at, but we anticipate that that may be a point of negotiation with the haulers as well. Um, and potentially it may be a discussion about if, if we discover that um, they don't do that visual inspection and we're delivering materials that are compromised to the processing site that, you know, there may be some discussion about who takes care of the expenses on that end. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. So. Um, I am supportive of staff's recommendations and the sustainability commission's recommendations moving forward. Um, I do have one question though. Um, are we going to keep the current drop sites available for people who are living in um, multifamily residential properties? Um, if we are not, is there any other way for them to access the organics recycling, any other kind of models that we could use? Laura, do you wanna take that one? Sure, Mayor and Council Member Carter. At this time, we haven't made a formal decision on whether or not we would keep those open. Um, however, they are relatively inexpensive to keep open. Um, the, the bulk of the cost is creating the drop-off site itself. And so I think we would see a lot of value in still providing the opportunity for residents who live in multifamily dwellings who don't have the city service to still have an opportunity to divert that material. Great, I'm glad to hear that. And I would I would be strongly in favor of that, um, considering the large proportion, but I think it's about 40% of our, our population now in Bloomington is they're, in rent they're renters. And so I just wanna make sure that we're providing that access and, and, and not taking away access that people have currently. So thank you. Uh, and Council Councilman Luke Carter, uh, Mayor and Councilman Luke Carter, I, I would also, Add to that that as we looked at the numbers, it appears that there is a significant number of uh, apartment dwellers who are already participating in the drop-off program. So we certainly would not, it seems like it would be um, counterproductive to uh, cut them off from the ability to, uh, to uh, uh, participate in some way of um, getting rid of their uh, organics in an environmental friendly way. Thank you for sharing that that data. And I couldn't agree more, Chair Sandry, so thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, Councilmember Carter. That's a, that's a good question, hadn't thought of that one. Councilmember Beloga. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so in looking at the schedule and the process, uh, there's an underlying assumption in there that says uh, we're going to get this deal done with the consortium. And to Councilmember Nelson's comment earlier about uh, going out for bid, uh, what's the drop dead date that we have to have a deal with the um, consortium? so that we have the opportunity to utilize an RFP if we come to loggerheads with the um, uh, consortium. I can try this one, Ellen. Sure. <laughs> Feel free to chime in. But Mayor and Council Member Beloga, we did also develop an alternative schedule for, for the route of an RFP. We didn't include that in, in that in this presentation, but that has been developed. And it's something that we have uh, worked with finance staff to let them know of that potential scenario as well. Um, based on our evaluation of the time needed, we anticipate that we would still be able to provide a service by the early part of 2022. We would not probably meet that January 1st deadline, but we could still have a service made available to residents within the first month or so of the year. Well, I, so what is the backing up date uh, mean that we terminate dealing with the consortium and go to the RFP? What, what's that date? If you look, at, um, Mayor and Council Member Beloga, if you look at, uh, at our schedule here, I think a time for that would be when we return to council for approval on a draft agreement 
So if at that time, after we have negotiated with the consortium and evaluated their proposal, and we have not come to an agreement with the consortium, uh, we could bring that to council. Or alternately, if council does not uh, agree with the recommendation to move forward with the consortium, then at that time, we could move to the RFP process. So that's a May date, if uh, I, I'm reading that correctly. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Good. And since carts are one of the leading items, does it make sense to have all of those carts named as Bloomington rather than, uh, you know, the, the several haulers that we have in the consortium? Um, uh, Mayor, uh, Council Member Beloga, um, the, under the scenario that we've discussed so far, the haulers would continue to own those carts and manage those carts. If the city decided that we wanted to go down the road of purchasing carts, which is a pretty substantial um, upfront capital investment, um, that would be a time where we could probably brand those carts with the city logo um, because we would own them. Um, in the scenario that we've put forward this evening, the, the, count, the haulers would continue to own the carts. And so um, they um, would likely not want to brand them totally with our logo. Although I do believe that we have a provision within the draft scope that would say that they do have to label it with some of our information. Well, uh, if I understood earlier, the uh, comment is, is that uh, carts and equipment are uh, uh, extreme lead times. If we had in Bloomington, that gives us more flexibility then to have the um, uh, RFP successful bidder buy out those Bloomington logo carts from the consortium members, but just a thought. And the recycle, uh, the pickup cycle would be weekly. Is that what I'm understanding? That's correct. Thank you. Council, additional questions, comments, thoughts on this? I do not see hands going up. So again, next steps would be that uh, as we as we talk about this tonight, if we move this forward, that uh, the next steps would be then to um, finalize the scope of service and, and start work with consortium uh, on, on the negotiations and the proposal. Is that correct? Um, Mayor, council members, yes. Uh, we would uh, like to get council approval for the scope of services so that we can begin our, our more formal conversations with the haulers about the, the program. Sounds good. Council, if there are no additional questions, comments, or concerns yes, on this, I would look for action. I do see council member Beloga. Council member Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, sorry that I have another thought. Is there any way we can start this other than in the dead of winter? I mean, it, it, I can't think of a worse time than right at the holidays and in the middle of the winter to uh, try to start this program up. Is there a way that we can get it in March or? I mean, some other date? I, I would agree with you, Council Member. I think the, I mean, it's the state law that says the beginning of 2020, 2022. Uh, our, I, I would ask our staff, are there penalties if we're, if we're two, three, four months late and try to put it more into a spring time frame? Um, Mayor, Council Members, we have had some discussions with Hennepin County about it. Um, they are the ones who have the mandate to have it offered by January 1st. Um, I think I think, you know, kind of based on some of our conversations with them, they recognize the, the scope of these programs and the challenge of um, moving them forward. Um, and, you know, our understanding with them is that if that timeline has to be stretched slightly, that they would be um, willing to work with us on that. Um, however, if we were to postpone it, 
I think significantly, we would probably put um, some of the funding that we received from Hennepin County in jeopardy. So the score funding that we received for our recycling and potentially eventually our organics program um, either could be reduced or delayed or um, uh, eliminated um, if, if they don't feel that we are moving forward in good faith. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I think there has to be a recognition with the scope of this uh, um, and, and really the short fuse that's been provided uh, to say that uh, the timing is not uh, ideal and can be detrimental to the success of the rollout. Um, thank you for that response. And I would agree, Council Member, and, and I'm, I'm sure we're not alone in our concerns. And all the cities in Hennepin County are probably thinking the same thing. Council Member Lohman and then Council Member Martin. Council Member Lohman. Uh, Mayor, when we're ready, I'm happy to make the motion. I'll go ahead and uh, uh, if uh, Council Member Martin wants to. Why don't you stand by on that, and I'll see if Council Member Martin has a question. Council Member Martin? Uh, thank you. Well, th this is more just uh, maybe something when this comes back to us next time, I I'd be curious if we get more information, just especially in terms of cost offsets, um, if possible to residents. I, I just know uh, affordability of home ownership in Bloomington has been a, a, something that's come up at darn near every meeting um, as far back as I can remember now. Um, and it, I, I do think it's important we acknowledge that $6 a month um, in added cost um, for a single family home, especially considering that this is going to be charged to multifamily, um, is, is pretty substantial. 64 bucks a year is, is nothing to, to sneeze at. So it, yeah, it just if, if there's any programs outside of the city that folks can leverage, um, again, the education portion that has been mentioned uh, to downsize carts, but even then it's not going to eliminate the entirety of the increase uh, on folks' monthly bills. Uh, and at the same time, just earlier tonight, we mentioned um, we're going to get slammed from the commercial industrial shifting over the residential side of things. So I, I'm excited about the program overall, but I, I just did kind of want to be a little bit of a stick in the mud to say um, this is obviously not going to be free. So thank you very much. Council, anything else? If not... Councilmember Lohman, looking for a motion. There, I'll move to uh, approve the scope of services for citywide organics recycling program. Second. second. We have a motion by Councilmember Lohman and a second by Councilmember Carter to approve the scope of services for a citywide organics recycling program. Hearing no further discussion, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Bloga. Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you much. Thanks to the uh, to the staff for your work on this and pulling this together. I think this is uh, an exciting next step, a next phase in terms of uh, sustainability and environmental stewardship here in Bloomington. And now comes the tough part. Uh, to make it all work between now and the first of the year or in the dead of winter, as Council Member Beloga said. So thank you much. Well done. Chair Sandry, thank you. Thanks for your leadership on this, as always, and thanks for spending your time with us this evening. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. Thanks, Mayor and Council Members. Council, we're at the bottom of the hour here with 30 minutes left, and what I would like to propose here, if we could, would be to uh, flip-flop items 8.6 and 8.7. So the property option for the possible fleet maintenance garage site, I think we have to get done tonight, and I would like to make sure that we do that. So um, uh, if, there is no, if there is no objection, I would like to flip-flop these two um, agenda items and uh, go to 8.7 and then come back to 8.6 at the end of the evening if we have time. Are we good with that? Very good. Then I'd like to call item 8.7, which is a property option for a possible fleet maintenance garage site. And that, I believe, is uh, John Brad, Mr. Bradford, our maintenance supervisor, is here. Again, good evening. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, apparently, the video of my basement isn't working at the moment. So. No, no. I didn't mean <laughs> to shame you, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know how disappointed you are. I am trying to get the video going, but it won't go. <clears throat> um. 
I am uh, sharing the presentation. Is uh, is the correct slide up? Yes, uh, it is. You've got the first slide up. Excellent. Uh, this evening, we're going to be talking about a property option. The uh, Back on January 25th, we presented six possible sites. Two of them were on city-owned property. Four of them were on adjacent properties. Uh, Currently, one of those is on the market and for sale, and that's at 1750 96th Street West. Uh, one property has confirmed that they do not want to sell, and two are undetermined as of yet. So some considerations as we look at these properties, all four of the adjacent property values appraise uh, or are for sale at around $3 million uh, plus and minus. Um, the uh, uh, three of the properties have tenants in them, and in discussions with our property representative, uh, he believes that relocation costs could be well over a million dollars on any of those three properties. Uh, only the uh, 1750 96th Street property is currently unoccupied. Uh, staff believes that there are two primary options that we are looking at. And one is the existing site with the parking ramp, which I will show you here as a reminder. It was labeled as a site option number eight, uh, where we were going just north of the existing public works building. And then we had an additional uh, parking ramp because of all the parking that we were uh, displacing. Uh, and the subject site that we're talking about this evening, which is 1750 96th Street West. So this area, uh, the Public Works North Garage is located on the map for you. It's adjacent to the railroad tracks, uh, just to the west of James Avenue. Uh, we have put together a possible layout for this option, uh, just to do a, a fit analysis to see if the site is adequate. And we, uh, we believe that we can get an adequate uh, a fleet maintenance garage on this property. Uh, it may not meet every every last uh, nook of what we're hoping to achieve, but it gets us really close. So the option to buy, to buy this property, which is before you tonight, uh, the option would run from tomorrow through June 15th of this year. Uh, the asking price for the property is approximately $3 million. And uh, that price would be contingent upon an appraisal, an environmental review, and finally council approval. Um, <clears throat> so essentially when an appraisal comes back, we would talk with the property owner and uh, negotiate a price based on the appraisal. Uh, the cost for the option is $7,000 a month, and we have three and a half months, so a total of $24,500. Uh, and this would apply to the purchase price at closing. Uh, the $7,000 per month is slightly less than the lease rate for the building. Uh, and the owner would agree not to lease or sell the space until uh, June 15th of 2021. Our current schedule is to evaluate this site, the other sites for operational considerations and update all of our cost estimates. Really take a close look at uh, that site option eight and the parking ramp and what that would look like, what that would really cost, uh, what are the impacts to the site of having the uh, parking garage on site, uh, as well as the, the other sites and confirm whether or not any of those property owners are willing sellers, firm up what relocation costs might be, uh, and then report back in count to council in May so that uh, uh, we can make a site recommendation and ask for council on how we should proceed. So with that, that's sort of the skinny of what we're talking about tonight. If there's any questions regarding the materials I've presented and any initial thoughts or concerns uh, about the uh, options, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Council, questions on this, a, uh, an option on, on the property would buy us some time to, to decide if this would be the correct place to be with our, with our maintenance garage. Uh, I will ask uh, Mr. Bradford, is the, 
do the constraints of the railroad tracks, are, are they a major constraint? Are they an issue to have them running right alongside the property? And um, are, are they an issue in any way? Mr. Mayor, no, they're not. There's always an environmental concern about purchasing property next to a railroad track. Uh, you just never know what is what has happened if there was a spill or anything like that. Our our preliminary look in the um, uh, DNR database doesn't show any uh, contaminating likely uses of the property, but we just want to make sure that we know what we're getting into before we would enter into a purchase agreement. Certainly, is uh, is is that how often is that little short line stub used? How how busy is that track? It, it's not terribly busy. It's only serving the uh, property directly west of the public works building. Uh, there's a uh, a salt packaging uh, industry in there, and I believe they bring salt in on the rail cars. All right. Thank you, Council. Any additional questions on this? Any thoughts? Mr. Mayor, if I may, Mr. I just Rubigi. want to clarify um, <clears throat> one item. The uh, John, if you can uh, discuss again the, the option cost and whether it um, is a deduct from the uh, eventual purchase price or a uh, uh, an addition to. Well, um, thank you for that for that question, uh, Mr. Manager. The uh, it, it's interesting. The owner called and, and requested that it be in addition to the asking price, and I had suggested to the owner that it's probably better to increase the asking price at this stage and have it uh, be applied towards the uh, um, the purchase price. I, I would say at this point. Uh, it probably doesn't matter too much because we'll be negotiating a price. Um, the approximate $3 million that we've been talking about is uh, essentially the asking price for the property. Um, and after the appraisal comes in, we will go back and negotiate a price. And frankly, we'll be taking in that $24,000 into account as we negotiate uh, the price of the property. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how to answer the question, to be honest. Um, all right. To be clear, it's just all part of the negotiation is essentially what you're saying. Yes. Thank you. See council member Loman and council member Beloga. council member Loman. Thank you, mayor. Uh, so I guess, uh, the only thing I would say, my only comment is I'm a little bit concerned when I see uh the plans and it doesn't really quite and you make the statement that uh this doesn't really quite fit what we were thinking um so it, it does concern me a little bit um and maybe you know maybe we can't make it work with what we've got out there but that that does concern me and certainly this does buy us some time to figure out um uh, what would happen now i assume that if we don't go with this site uh the money would be would be lost right we wouldn't be able to keep that right uh mr mayor council member uh, you are correct that that we would lose the uh, the money that we're putting into the option. Uh, when I say it's not 100% perfect, we achieved 20 of 22 uh, bays, and that's a very preliminary sketch that we just uh, penned together. Uh, and and frankly, 20 stalls is is an incredible improvement over over what we currently have, um, but. During this next uh, two months, we will be working very hard to get uh, up to 22 stalls on that site, and uh, we just need some time to get there. I guess what it concerns me is is that uh, I mean our current position we're in, the expandability was was one of the issues, and I just get concerned about you know pressing us into that. You know, when I hear that, it just makes me the alarm bells go off. So I just that's what I wanted to throw back at you. Certainly, certainly, and and in a perfect world, um, you know, to be to be quite honest, one of the neighboring properties is is probably the best answer, 
uh, but I, I'm concerned that uh, the between the price of the property, the prices of uh, um, uh, relocation may make that infeasible or um, difficult to get to. And um, uh, so we're just trying to be uh, prudent and investigate every option. Councilmember Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, I find it uh, a, a bit strange that we're uh, being asked to uh, approve negotiations for land for an item that we have not yet approved. And uh, this is tantamount uh, tacit approval by council, uh, one could say to uh, approve a $27 million project instead of a $3 million land purchase. Well, I think uh, I'm, that is a way to look at it, Councilmember Beloga. Uh, I think what we are trying to do is with the, with the $24,500 is to buy the time to figure out if it's the best. And, and I agree that it, if we were approving the purchase price of the land right now, I would agree that yes, then we are, we're in pretty deep. But um, um, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that this is still under both negotiation and consideration. Um, with with other, other options, I would hope are at least still on the table if this doesn't work out. Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for those thoughts. Uh, and one could uh, say that, but uh, really, it means that instead of making that decision on March 2nd, we're making it on June 15th. But uh, tantamount, it's uh, just a matter of, uh, you know, a couple months. So the underlying concept is still that uh, uh, we're pretty much locking the city in to uh, a new maintenance garage without having approved it. Mr. Verrugge, what's the timing? What, what do we lay out as the timing for the maintenance garage in terms of the different steps we were taking? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, um, I think council member Beloga is correct that once we acquire the land, you certainly have uh, a, a certain amount of uh, cash out. And, uh, you know, there's a, the, the only way to avoid having that happen is if we were to uh, prioritize the build on site option. And so one of the things that staff will be doing is evaluating the um, uh, potential site that we're trying to secure with the option versus the build on site. And uh, if you end up purchasing the property, then it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going forward with the project. You've certainly acquired the land to do it. Uh, the plan right now is that we would begin construction in uh, 23, I believe, um, two years from now. And uh, council can make a decision to defer the project indefinitely, however long they want, and they could hold on to the property. So I, I disagree with the idea that you're essentially making a decision that you're approving the garage. Um, you are making a decision in June if we execute on the option that you've acquired property for expansion of the public works facility. Councilmember Belog, anything else? Uh, points well taken by uh, the city manager. Um, there seems to be a number of moving parts that uh, I'm, I'm just uncomfortable with the timing. If we had a longer uh, uh, option period so that we could work more of those items out, then I'd feel more comfortable with the comments by the manager. Um, Two and a half months uh, doesn't buy you a great deal of time. Uh, John, when when can they really do the environmental review? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Beloga, the, uh, we'll be doing a phase one and a phase two in the course of the next eight weeks. Um, I have not scheduled that yet. Uh, we do have a provision in the agreement that the uh, um, 
that the uh, uh, option can be extended if mutually acceptable to both the city and the uh, property owner for the same terms? And when will we have the uh, build on site option fully fleshed out? Well, it won't be, it'll be fleshed out in a concept level for the our May meeting. You know, there's a uh, concept level is the best that we can do. Um, and, and the difficulty with, with a project like this, where we're not sure where we want it to go, it's a question of how much money do we want to spend on designing our concept designs. And uh, so we're trying to take a an approach where we spend a little bit of money putting concepts together that we have a high degree of confidence that will work, that will meet our needs uh, and be reasonably cost efficient. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, going back to the schedule, what we had looked at was property acquisition in 2021, uh, design in 2022, and construction in 2023. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, one follow up. Councilmember Beloga. Thank you. Uh, John, so uh, we will have some initial. Uh, opportunities uh, to look at that uh, uh, sketch um, and to uh, also look at uh, how long into the future the size of this building is anticipated to serve the needs of the community if it's built on this site. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Beloga. That is correct. And actually, uh, those drawings and the cost estimates uh, associated with them were in the packet for the January 25th council, mem council meeting. Uh, and we are currently revising those uh, so that uh, we get a better look at it. I don't think that the concept design will change necessarily for the on site, but we'll be looking, uh, taking another look at the, uh, at the cost of it. Um, and uh, we'll be presenting that information in May. Well, uh, and, and my, my concern, John, is it's more about, uh, um, you know, we want to build these things to last a long time. You know, 50 years is uh, a pretty short time for uh, these kinds of buildings. And, um, the sketches that I was referring to principally are the, the, the maintenance facility on this parcel of land. Yes, Council Member Beloga will have that uh, in uh, uh, greater detail and uh, fleshed out as to what we believe we can fit on that site and what the plan would be if that property was acquired. And uh, uh, last comment is, is uh, how long do we expect its useful life to be? And, and I'm not looking for that answer today because I think you need to put a pen to paper on that one. There's a lot of crystal ball in that one. As, as you all know, council member, uh, uh, the, uh, um, I, I think that, that we have a tendency to over anticipate how long something will be uh, um, too big or big enough. I, I think we we uh, we all in our industry tend to think that things will last uh, or be be functional longer than they uh, longer than they actually are, and uh, um, especially with all the changes in transportation and the changes of technology going on. Uh, that'll be a very difficult answer, but we will do our best to have one for you in May. Well, the, the biggest uh, known is, is that the size of our land bases will not change. So 
uh, you know, the number of miles of roads won't appreciably change that type of thing. So we do have some fixed points that we can uh, count on. So, but I agree with what your concept is in saying. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. No more comments. Thank you, Councilmember Beloga. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Just a quick one, um, because I, I certainly appreciate Councilmember Beloga's thoughts on, on sort of putting the cart before the horse and sit, making a decision when we're not saying that we're actually making a decision. And I guess the way that I sort of thought about this is, you know, if we're not going to purchase the land before finally making final approval on, on the project, then the alternative is is making final approval on the project before we purchase the land, which wouldn't make any sense, or the the build on site option that the city manager referred to that that presents its own challenges as well. So I, I generally agree with with the the concept of you know if we say we're approving something, let's actually approve it. Um, but I, I think this is the best option for for what we have right now. Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, does it make sense to extend the uh, meeting time by another, another five minutes so we can get the vote in and also uh, vote to uh, uh, adjourn the meeting? I, I think uh, it sounds to me like we're wrapping up discussion on this item. And then, then yes, I would uh, look to the council to see if we wanted to extend to try and get the, uh, the next item in as well. But uh, uh, are there additional questions or comments regarding this item in particular? I'd be happy to move this motion if we don't have any. I do not see anyone. Councilmember Lohman. I'd move to authorize the mayor and city manager to execute an agreement that preserves the city's ability to purchase the property at 1750 96th Street West, substantially consistent with the terms set forth in the staff report. Thanks, sir. We have a motion by Council Member Lohman and I believe a second by Council Member Martin to accept uh, item 8.7, the uh, authorizing the mayor and the city manager to execute an agreement to preserve the city's ability to purchase the property at 1750, 90, I don't have my glasses on, I'm gonna have trouble reading this, 1750, 96 Street West. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Beloga. Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Loman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Or Rusty? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Now, that the clock on the wall here in the city council chamber says it's just turned to 10 57. Uh, council, I would ask uh, your opinions. Do we, want to, do we want to extend the meeting for uh, an extra 10 or 15 minutes to try and get to items 8.6 and then our uh, Council policy and issues update, or are we looking at adjournment at 11 o'clock? I, I would learn, look to the council for your pleasure. Councilmember Beloga. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I would uh, move that we uh, uh, table 86 to a future date. Mr. Mayor. Second. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and council members. Thank you. That's, that's fine. Uh, Mr. Hansen and our uh, uh, our representative from Apex, Mr. Ackerman, are both uh, aware of that possibility, and we can bring them back to uh, either next week or the 15th should be just fine. And I, that would be my preference, too. I mean, we could do this item in 10 minutes, but, you know, this is, uh, I think this is an important discussion item, and I don't necessarily want to give it short shrift at this time of night. I would agree. Agree fully. So, Mr. Hansen, and uh, is it Mr. Ackerman that's with you this evening? Um Thank you for sticking with us. I apologize for doing this for you, doing this to you, but um, we're going to have to bring you back in a second time. So we have a motion by Councilmember Beloga and a second by Councilmember uh, Carter to table item 8.6, which is a solar subscription contract to uh, our next meeting. Hearing no further discussion of the council, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Beloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0.
So it looks like we've got a minute for the uh, item 8.8, .8, our City Council policy and issue update. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge, anything? I, I have nothing, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Coulter, is that an old hand or a new hand? It's a new hand, but they're very quick things. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, recognizing the hour, I have been hearing from folks, as I'm sure others have, about um, the closure of the motor vehicles office. And I'm wondering if at some point in the future, maybe we could get an update from staff on discussions uh, about a potential private vendor opening a, a deputy registrar office in Bloomington. I know, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's curious on the progress of those discussions. Um, and then the, the second one thing I wanted to bring up was really just something that came up to me earlier today, but it, it seems that with greater frequency, we are specifically calling for public comment on items at council meetings that are not public hearings. Um, and I, I guess it, it just feels to me like it's a little bit like there, there isn't sort of a, a standard way of, of approaching that or deciding when that happens and when it doesn't, other than when it's something that seems to be particularly controversial. Um, which seems to me to be kind of subjective. Um, so I guess I would just say that if, if we are going to continue doing that, I don't necessarily oppose that, um, that we at some point in the future have some discussion about how that decision is made and you know what, what kind of agenda items that, that applies to. Point well taken, Council Member Coulter. Uh... Mr. Verbrugge, anything on the first point of Council Member Coulter? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, we'll, we'll uh, provide information to the Council in the next few weeks. Very good. Anything else, Council? If not, Council, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Council Member Lohman. Second. Martin. A motion by Council Member Lohman, a second by Council Member Martin to adjourn this evening. Hearing no further discussion, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Bloga? Aye. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. Loman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Rusty? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. We are adjourned. Thank you much for the good meeting once again. Thanks to staff. Thanks to the folks who uh, brought information to us. And thank you to the council for the good discussion. Thanks to everybody who's watching this evening. Have a good night. Thanks, all. Good night. Thank you.